buddy. Let's see. Hello. Hello. Hello, Darkest Vampire. 92. Hello. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, Acerbic Acorn. Hello, Albazaski. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Mr. Richards. Hello, Rick Gasava. Hello, H. Mr. Verdun. <laughs> Hello, Brain Frenet. Oh, what time do you plan to be at Hamilton Airport on June the 5th? On June the 5th. I, I don't think I'm going to Hamilton Airport on June the 5th. I think we're going to the... Um, the uh, we're supposed to be going to... Let me... We'll get to that in a second. We'll get to the... There's a slide in here for the Canada trip. So what, when we come to the, 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 the... When the slide comes up, we'll go through the Canada trip. Because then I have a slide in front of me. And I'm like any academic. I need the slide in front of me. Okay? I need the slide. It helps me remember my thoughts. Uh, it's actually Steve Rochelle. Um, if I may, another question. Do you think any Navy and uh, other Navy nation could have pulled off the evacuation on Dunkirk? Um, I think basically you're talking about to have enough naval power to be able to do it. You're talking about a nation which either has to have a large navy or a large merchant marine or both. So Britain, America, Norway, to an extent, could all have done it. Um, Japan could have done it. But it's also not only having the ability to do it, but also the motivation to do it. And that's the interesting thing. And the opportunity. <laughs> but yeah, I think Britain is kind of uniquely poised in that they had the combination of the Navy, the Merchant Marine, and the willingness to do it, and the opportunity in terms of the distance it was viable. Um, a lot of things add up to make it a viable, a viable proposition for them to do. Hello, Sava Thompson. That's a big one. Lead people in the Galaxy class ships stray. Stray with. <laughs> they lead people in Galaxy class ships astray with their sexiness and difficult questions about canon. Hello, DG40. How Jamie? Yes, I like questions about canon. It can be fun. Hello, Sage. Good evening. It's Sunday tea time. It must be time for brain brain praise over Dr. Alex's channel. Hello, Derp Scott. Hello, Seneca Nero. Hello, Darius Rowski. Hello, John Farah. Hello, Graham Hyler. Hello, John Luke. And hello, Paul from Chicago. Uh, George Newman, USS the Sullivan's update for this week is clear and proceeding. So I hope it is. I have contacted them officially instead of just going through. There were various nice people who were helping with arranging that, and I decided that rather than go through side channels, I would basically go the full official route and make it as official as possible. And hopefully it would be okay. And hopefully we'll be able to get into the Sullivans. Now, speaking of the trip, this is my trip bag. My new one because, well, my old one had broken. And before you ask, why, Alex, do you have a special laptop bag for going on airplanes? Because it does this. Laptop straight through on the conveyor belt, and it's got the TSA lock. But leaving that to one side, it's now got something in it, which it, I've never had in one of these bags before. And basically, I wanted to say thank you to all of you, because without all of your support, especially probably Jack Ray, definitely especially because of Jack Ray, um, the squirrel, who is a lucky squirrel who comes with me everywhere I go, and I will not be off to Canada with all the stuff. Uh, as you all know, um, when I, as I've told the story before, when I was younger, I was going to get burnt, and this gentleman had his tail sticking out of my bag. So he got burnt rather than my neck. In which case, I therefore consider him a lucky squirrel, and he goes with me everywhere. I'm not sure if he is lucky, or not, but I've always had him with me, and I've touch wood, always been okay, and come back in one piece. So, yeah, I'm not saying I'm superstitious or anything, but yes, um, the squirrel comes with me. But, this has arrived today. 
the camera that I'll be using for my shots on the trip. And so that's in there. And that has the full bag to go into. It has its own bag within a bag. And backup hard drive to take with me for storing all the information. I thought if it's nice, bright, and gold, I can't lose it. Uh, I thought you could all be here while I quickly open up the camera. Uh, what have you got in it? Uh, hello, well, let's see. Uh, how long is your flight to Canada, Doc? Uh, about seven hours. Uh, Dev Squad, if the tech from 1944 being available in 1945, would the Navy, um, would the Navy, what's the, the can, uh, mod, delete uh, my nose, YouTube won't let me, uh, let me for some reason. Okay. I'll delete it for you. Should have gone, he says. Mm, nope, it's not letting me delete it either. And I'm supposed to be the Uber mod. Mm -hmm. uh, John Saf, the El Celsius is definitely a better ship in Star Trek Online. Mm, probably. Uh, no, no, what have you got in it? Uh, well, I've shown you what I've got in it, apart from, but this is going to go in it. Now, this is, of course, the camera, and it's going in the special camera case. The camera case is all the things I need to support the camera in it, including a power pack. Because, yeah. <laughs> He's a lightning no, rod. He's a lightning rod. I'm not sure, but he, I always come back okay with him. So I keep him. Uh, let's see, how are we getting in here? Oh, we're getting in that way. Why do these things all have so many different entry points? Hello. That looks like the camera. By the way, this is a very fun system I've decided already. Because, oh, hello. That's the story and the camera in it. And I'm going to have to learn to use this before I go. I do realise that. Um... Some people very nicely, people keep going, well, you know, maybe you can do it without it, and I, you can learn how to do it without learning, and I was going to go, no, I'm going to have to, this is another thing, I'm, uh, my best friend has kindly volunteered her wedding for me to practice using my camera, and here's appropriately the Canada trip, so before we get into the galaxy, we're discussing the Canada trip, so I'll put a timestamp, those people who want to skip ahead to where we get into the galaxy proper, please do feel free to skip ahead. Um, I have to work out where this goes, how this slots into this box. I think it goes in that way, but I'm not 100% sure. Because that would seem to be one option, but that's far too big. That looks like it's got too much space. That's the... This is the battery the power pack. Which plugs into this at a certain point, I presume. We're going to have to work out how you. Oh, of course, you plug into this one, plugs into uh, this. Which allows you to plug onto this. Yeah, that works out. Working this out is going to be fun. Right, I'm missing questions. I'm being naughty. I do apologise. I got distracted because this literally arrived. It wasn't supposed to be arriving till um, it wasn't supposed to be arriving till Friday. Oh uh, no, until Friday, uh, till uh, not Friday, till about um, well. Let's see, when was it supposed to be arriving? I think it was supposed to be arriving on Monday. Yeah, Monday. But I wasn't going to be able to get to access it or muck around with it till much later in the week because Monday, etc., and everything is full. Ooh, that looks like a better way to hold it in myself. That looks safer. Hmm. 
Run. Josh, where do you get a bag and what is it? Um, I have honestly no idea. I found, I, I've had one a couple of times. The previous one has disintegrated, which was a bit older. But it's this one I just got off Amazon and I just searched for the same make as I had previously. You will notice, of course, there is the important thing for Going Everyone World, a um, <clears throat> badge which has my details. So if my bag gets lost, people can work out whose it belongs to. Or rather, just enough details they can work out who it belongs to. Hang on, I have got the pack in here somewhere. I've got the. Yeah, I've got the carbs. So, the bag is uh, Delagao. So, yeah, as with everything, manufactured in China. And, yeah, it's it's a nice bag. Um, I have a, I've had a Swiss one as well quite regularly over the years, and they're usually fairly good. But they have been, uh, they, they've been getting more and more expensive, and this one was quite a, de this one was a decent price. Hello? Are you something technological, or are you something not? Right. How big is that drive? Uh, that drive, believe it or not, this one for the trip to Canada, my backup hard drive, is a very, very nice, very cool, as always, Toshiba, because they're always the ones I end up getting. And um, from memory, it's four terabytes. Yeah, I got the 4TB version. Which should just about have enough memory for our stuff. Uh, Sh uh, Shashank Naran, hello. Star Trek refits seem more like a ship of feces situation, more like uh, the RN refits, where everything, including the external structure, is changed, but it's only a refit, not a rebuild. Yes, why ever not? Makes sense for spaceships. Let's be honest, you're going to... Uh, the only thing that's really limiting you in the build and the rebuild in a spaceship is space, is time and is money. And if you're in a society which doesn't have the same financial issues that we have... Hello. That's something... What is this for? Oh, that's for plugging that into that. Oh, that'll be useful. And, um, oh, hello, there's that, which I'm fairly sure is some form of mic, from experience dealing with these things now. Because I've also got, of course, before anyone starts thinking I'm allowing anyone to go away without getting really proper mic'd up. Is this a Dr. Lark unboxing video? No, it's just a quick Canada briefing before I launch into the main video. Lots and lots of pockets in this thing. Lots and lots of pockets, which are good. It is always good to have lots of pockets, but uh, yeah, I also have this. And this is a set of radio mics, etc., which are supposed to go with it and are supposed to work. And I will get them all working before I go. I will get it all worked out. So I'll have radio mics, everything, and I'll have this camera sorted out and working. That seems like instructions. They will go in the box. That looks like... God, this has lots of fiddly bits in it. Cool. Lots of stuff for me to play with. Aglin shirt. Where do you... Uh, okay. And let's see. Oh. Ooh, my mother is currently on a cross pond flight. Royal Air Maroc 787. Good luck. Um, hi, Bitchin. It's all about the unboxing experience. Is it really? It's about the unboxing experience? Well, in my case, it's about the. Ooh, cute toy experience. <sighs> yeah, I'm that sad. I do admit it, and I have no qualms about admitting it. So.
Ooh, that goes in that bot hole. I'm finding out where the various thing, which holes the various things that have come with it, uh, come in this box go. Slowly, he says. Slowly, we figure out which hole they pot into, uh, which pots into which. It took some time, possibly more time than we should admit, uh, than I should admit to. But you know. Most of life is fun. Ooh, more mics. Lots of mic stuff. Okay. That's good. That's good. And there we go. That's all put in the thing. It's organized. Sort of. That's a fluffy mic. That's a fluffy. So this comes with its own mic stuff. That's good. That I can use. Yeah. But no, um, I have got to go with it, of course. You always need memory. So I've got a couple of these. And the plan is to download it every night onto the hard drive. So that should be okay. But no, that's the candle trip. Right, there were questions there about where and when we are. Um, I fly into Canada and I reach Toronto Airport on the 2nd. At some point on the second, I'm not going to say what time or uh, exactly because honestly, uh, it's a, a cross Atlantic flight, and in my experience with cross Atlantic flights, the moment you say the words "we will get there on this time" is the moment you will not get there anywhere near that time. Uh, my plan is then to go pick up the car because I'm get <laughs> getting the car for us, and then once I've got that, uh, I go off to Hamilton. To have fun in Hamilton for a bit, and to go see Hyder probably, knowing me. Um, that'll be fun. And then after I've gone to see Hyder, I will be, well, next day, get up, go see Hyder again, and actually wander around Hyder on my own. Or, well, actually, I think I've got Glyn coming as company. So that'll be fun. And, um,. <sighs> Drac arrives with the rest of the crew. I pick them up from Toronto Airport. We go to dinner. And then the next day, on the 4th, we are filming on Hyder. That's when everyone else can hop along if they want. And then on Sunday, we are heading to the Canadian Aviation Museum, because that's mine and Drac's first choice. But mine and Drac also have another choice of going to see Niagara Falls. We're going to get there at some point during this trip because I have told Drac that I am getting there because I feel it's unfair that I have been so close to Niagara Falls on so many occasions and have yet to actually manage to make it there. I left another bit in there. Ooh, what cute, uh, what bit is this? Anyway, um, and then Monday, if everything's okay with the Sullivans and all is happy and all works out well. We will go and see the Sullivans, which will be fun. And then fly to Halifax on the Tuesday, visit Sackville on the Wednesday, go to the Canadian, well, probably the Museum of the Atlantic, actually, more on the Thursday. We'll probably spend more time there. And then fly back to Hamilton, film Ojoa. Um, have another, have sort of Saturday where we might go and see Niagara Falls if we haven't managed to do that during the 5th, and then fly home on the Sunday. That's our trip. It's going to be a fun trip. It is. Hello, Mr. Shaw. Okay. All right then. Uh, Ian Winter, the King George V had the B turret dropped to the twin due to weight limit. Would have been any be better way making the uh, C turret to twin and having a, fun, uh, a four eight gun so on? No, you couldn't really have done that. But myself, I, as you know many times, I would of course like it to be three triple fifteen inch guns. Um, but 
I think three triple 15 inch turrets would have been far better way to go. But leaving that to one side, and then using the 15 inch upgrade, a 15 inch gun to upgrade all the R's and Queen Elizabeth's and Renown, Repulse, Hood, basically everything you can with a better 15 inch gun would have been the sensible way to go. But there again, I am someone who's infrastructure and logistics obsessed, to quote many of my colleagues. Uh, that's good. If the Navy had the tech and refits from 1944 available in 1945, would they have put the capital ships in the channel support evacuation, or would Luftwaffe still be too much of a threat? Um, they probably... It wasn't so much that, that they would have been too much of a threat. You have to remember, it's not about the threat of the Luftwaffe so much that keeps the capital ships out of the channel. This is one of the things that's often sort of put forward, and it's not quite correct. In that it's not the cha the Luftwaffe that's worried about, it's mines and submarines. And the fact is they don't have enough anti-mine anti -mine warfare trawlers and they don't have enough of the flower class yet in service and definitely not enough of the hunt class yet in service yet to be able to do that with the capital ships and not be worried about what might happen versus torpedo boats and submarines and mines. Uh, you have to clear huge channels. It's another reason why aircraft carriers don't take part in D-Day. It's one of those big questions. People go, why were there no carriers at D-Day? Well, because to operate an aircraft carrier, you'd have had to clear a huge, stonking, great big area from mines, and you didn't need it. So it's the same with the capital ships. If you needed them, if a German capital ship threat had appeared, they would have appeared thundering down like anything. But without it appearing, it's a risk you don't need to run. So Galaxy Class versus Imperial Star Destroyer, who wins? Um, well, I did I did look into the science and tech on this, and apparently the Star Destroyer has the more powerful weapons. But uh, in my view, the Galaxy has the maneuverability and also has transporter systems. So if they could get a photon torpedo into the right place, that could cause a lot of trouble for a uh, Imperial Star Destroyer because, as we all know, necessarily having a big explosion is lovely, but having the uh, enough of explosion in the right place can cause a lot of trouble. As we have a gay one, Southern Ontario is swinging between very hot and uh, very hot and very wet. Oh, good. Well, um. I'll be in short. I'll I'll be in a t-shirt and trousers the entire time. I can guarantee that, because that's what I wear ninety nine percent of the time if I can get away with it. Thank you, Stafford. Stafford and Wayne are organising the dinner on the fourth. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone. Right then, so let's put in this. So, calendar announcements. Do, 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 do. Let's make sure I answered all the questions, and then we'll go for 25 minutes. Uh, Right. The thing is, can you charge your camera in Canada? Are they 240 volts, three pin plugs like over there? Here. No, they're not, but um, I have something with me which sorts out that problem. A, it plugs into the laptop to charge, USB style, and B, Does actually do UK as well, but um, luckily for US, Australia, and Canada, apparently got USB slots and allows me to plug in a free pin plug if I want to a UK style, but also allows me to plug in anything else as well. So I can connect anything, any plug to any plug. 
using this plug, which is useful. Again, it's a cool toy, but a cool, uh, it's a good system. Um, there's actually what if the Navy funded Frank Whittle's little uh, jet development and it was ready and used in a Raycon fighter flying boat with airframe coming off a uh, config of HE162 Salon. Um, there is actually a design which is not too dissimilar to that which shows what the British would probably have gone have done with, um, which is the, ro uh, the row, um, ooh, I forget what its number is. But it's a really quite interesting aircraft, and it would have caused a lot of interesting things, and also might have made Atrium's Pegasus really useful. <laughs> Staff Nozzle, for dinner meeting people for a few hours on the night of the 3rd, they are within a good walk or short drive from Atrium and CS Hyder, so, so time isn't restricted due to distance. That's very good. Uh, I think the dinner's on the 4th. On the f night of the 4th. Um, on the 3rd... We are... Uh, we uh, On the 3rd, we are basically... I'm picking up the uh, all the team at Toronto, and then... Well, we have been invited to a nice dinner. And it, if Stafford and Glynn want to talk about that one, they can. I'm just going to say that one. Right, so... I so I can enjoy peeling the protective film on the lens of the screen. I will do. I don't hear. Yes. Dan is actually also is of course coming with us. So Dan, you know, we are we are, me and Drac are quite happy to use you as your medical role to assist in organizing things. Pleasure. Need to sit in the also Need to the evasion museum myself at some point. You can always just tag along with us. Right? You know, we, we, we don't mind people tagging along. Okay. All right. Right. So. Galaxy class. The 24th century for the Federation. Okay. This is the first thing. Because you always have two problems with the Federation, as far as I'm concerned. Their admirals are either very good or completely and utterly incompetent and mildly evil. They're never anything in between. And I do put this down to the fact that I never hear any mention of a decent staff college in, Can in the Federation. Uh, they have people who will go off and become captains. They get to service as a captain, and suddenly they're made an admiral. And, you know, you go, yeah, you need a bit of training before you transition. It's a very different thing to go from being a captain of a ship to an admiral. And in many ways, I would say that Deep Space Nine... And... How do I put this? The career of Benjamin Sisko is possibly the most instructional on this. In that Benjamin Sisko goes off and becomes a staff officer. He's already had diplomatic theater command sort of experience. Yes, Picard has task group command experience, which he's suddenly put in the role of. Yes, he's a trusted senior officer. And you can to extent suggest that a starship captain already needs to have quite a lot of those skills. But suddenly becoming a, a task group commander is a big jump. And this is the problem. Uh, John Luke Picard points this out in 2364. A lot has changed in 300 years. People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. Really? 
We have eliminated hunger, wants, and need for possessions. We have grown out of our infancy. I don't think, I honestly, that the Federation has quite, literally, has quite done that. However, well, look at these maps. And this is the first one, which is always interesting to me, this map. Mainly because... The Federation just looks so darn massive. You have basically the Federation, which is the United States of Planets. And the Romulans, the Klingons, the Cardassians. They're all around the Federation, as it, you would expect in any sort of space scenario, because there's not going to be an edge of the map. But, um... I say this with a lot of love and respect for the Federation. If you're this surrounded, how in the name of all things holy do you justify not having ships built as warships? I don't know which moron comes up with that idea. And the only option I can come with is that's a political decision, so they do it. But then they're frantically behind the scenes every ship they can that has a war fight can have a war fighting capability has it included in a major way and an expandable way so all the ships you're seeing are in their science configuration uh, or maybe their lifestyle configuration or whatever you want to call them their beatbox configuration and at very quickly, they have sitting around in yards the ability to rip out that uh, that configuration and put in their war fighting configuration, which they already written up. That sort of starts to make sense because otherwise, you're looking at this and telling me that a uh, out of a civilization which is this surrounded by powers. Let's be honest, the Romulans are always intriguing and basically constantly up to something. The Klingons, the Klingons are special. The Klingons are wonderful. I have a great love and respect for them, and I actually have spent far too much of my life learning how to try and use a bat left properly. So I have a lot of love and respect for the Klingons, but I wouldn't exactly also want to turn my back on them and have not have ships which were anything less than fully military capable anywhere near that border. And then we have the Cardassians, who, as we know, Managed to get into so many fights and write so many checks they can't actually cash that they end up getting taken over by uh, the lovely people from the Delta Quadrant, the Dominion. Okay. Yeah. Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Gamma. It's complicated. Don't worry, I love how I'm learning about the trip I'm going on via YouTube. You are, yeah, you're just basically coming along. Um, outside of GayCon, maybe their staff college is all distance education, taken over the many, many, many years to get to be captain. Yeah, I, I I love the idea of distant education staff college taking over the many, many years to become a captain. But then you've got a problem. And if you consider, unless you're telling me that actually the, U the Federation ships are overcrewed, or rather are not undercrewed to the same level most modern democracies should crew their ships, and most democracies crew their vessels in peacetime, I don't see the officers having the free time to do all their duties, especially when those duties can include random away missions where you are likely to lose half a dozen red shirts. Seriously, security officers, it's almost it becomes a bigger trope as star uh, 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 as stormtroopers in um in Star Wars. It's just a case of Okay, really? At least during the Clone Wars, they could hit their targets. But it's, a, it's one of the things is sort of 
they are absolutely perfectly ba uh, uh, skilled fighters whenever they're not fighting any uh, whenever they're fighting anyone else but the main characters That's what I was thinking. Yes, but Saunders Row 44 is a bigger two-engine flying boat with about armed with four cannons. A smaller single-engine plane armed with 250 cal, the size of Warus flying 600 kilometers an hour, could uh, muck up a top run on a 4C. It could do, but honestly, and I say this politely, Darius, the, the British are probably going to go with a twin-engine version. Because the British are very, very cautious when it comes to jet design and, and when it comes to air, uh, water as well. Mm-hmm. Vision, the job of an admiral is to die so the hero can be a hero. Mm, potentially. As a, as a big Ackland, the massive limitation of accurately representing 3D space on a 2D map on a galactic scale, no less. I was trying my best for that. Which might be a demonstrator he went to in all, 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 to it in all honesty. Hmm. Uh, Jack Ray, wasn't it Gene Roddenberry who decided, decided for the Federation to not build warships? Yes, it was. The creator. They don't build warships. But the trouble is, it's not a warship. But it has to do a lot of warshipy things. And they're explorer cruisers, not capital ships, honestly. And they are exploration cruisers, they just also have a dual role. Just something, I think the Federation doesn't build warships in the same way the Japanese Self Defense Forces does not build carriers. Potentially. Dan Freeman, is the ability to quickly swap the source section a way, a way to go, quickly go from science to war? I don't think officially that's included as an option to swap out the entire saucer section. I'm not sure. I haven't seen around the Starfleet yards. That's a big icon. I think it makes sense that no, the no warship claim is based on the United Federation plants having the industrial economic might to go to gold plate basically all their warships beyond the combat role. Hmm. I think it's more true they don't have ships that are just warship. I think that is the thing. When I start looking at it, that is definitely more of an idea. Uh, the Federation. By 2267, so this is about 100 years prior to what I'm talking about, its territory had expanded across a thousand planets. Because of the cosmopolitan nature of the United Federation of Planets, its territory included at least 150 member worlds spanning across 8,000 light years of interstellar space, with thousands of colonies and outposts, vast expanse of uninhabited space, and even planets inhabited by pre-war civilizations, directly incorporated under the political jurisdiction of Federation space as of 2370. That's, um, fun. Here is the point. If you're a pre-war civilization in the Federation, when you reach warp level, what happens is usually a galaxy, or another potentially almost as large, Federation starship will show up. And they'll go, hello, welcome to the, inter inter uh, the interplanetary family. Would you like to join the Federation? If you do, you get access automatically to all this technology. You get to be part of this the, all these civilizations. And by the way, but as part of this, we're going to give you a full download of all the risky civilizations in there. So look, here, meet Klingons. Yeah. With Battler. Here, meet Romulans. We will blow you up and take over your planet. Uh, or you could join us. We're so nice and friendly and our ships are so shiny. Yeah. What would any sensible leader do in that scenario um the thing is you don't need to lie to basically make yourself look like the least worst option do you
They're on sale. Hello, the Nebula class is a good example of vessels that have multiple pods, including an AWAX mod and a torpedo mod. Hmm. Alright, it's mostly down to the post World War III angst and Vulcan influences. Hmm. Yeah. Vision. Frankly, Starfleet has never has never been well thought out. Star Wars, for its all, tries hard with the world building of governance and military services. Almost going too far sometimes, let's be honest with Star Wars. So, I think the Federation starships might be overcrowded because almost every ship has a captain. I think we saw that their war reserve mobilization looks like the uh, looks like with the Romulan blo blockade. Um. Well, yeah, with the Romulan blockade, suddenly, we are short captains. Okay, I'm sending out my officers from my ship to take command. Why? Okay, I can understand you sending out executive officers, but surely you wouldn't just send the executive officers from your ship. You'd call up other captains and go, all right, I need to borrow your executive officer to run here, and your executive officer... You don't go, I'm going to send out my third officer to run this ship. How short of commanding officers are you if you're doing that? Jack yeah, right. I like how Captain Jamie was like, we come in. What? Are you trying to rob me? Phase of iron. All right, let's move on. It was an interesting experience for her. And uh, Dan Freeman, are the red shirts from Star Trek just replicated through the telepuddles rather than being real people? They never say that, but if you store someone's pattern in a teleporter buffer as a backup, you could theoretically do that. Might also explain why they always, uh, it sometimes looks like to be the same red shirts from the last episode were dying again. So, Thompson, given the Dreadnought Enterprise that saved 1701C was still a Federation ship, what would the Terran Empire version be? <laughs> Every single weapon they can get. Lower decks flat out calls them cavalry ships, distinguish them from the smaller ships, loops like California. Yes, but lower decks has this um, rather fun approach to the whole thing of we're going to poke jokes at Starfleet for years. They've called this a cruiser, and let's be honest, it is a capital ship when it's in fully armed up mode. Even in TS, they are stated to have fought wars with Klingons and Romans, so it must have some combat capability. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Glenn Stewart, what's the root beer quote? Of course, from famously from Quark. It's sweet and cloying and grows on you, like the Federation. Yeah, root beer. Uh, CJ90, also, not even all Federation members are peaceful pacifists like the Vulcans, like the Andorians. No, the Andorians are definitely not peaceful pacifists. I like the new chief engineer in the new, in the new um, Star Trek. It's fun. Having Pike having an Andorian chief engineer does make things interesting. Yeah, I think there is a thing that during the galaxy period, uh, they went peace divid. They did go peace divid, and like H. S. Jonathan is saying, and decided that you know, twenty fourth century, we have outgrown war. We can of we no longer need to worry about this. We can move on from this, and I think that's part of it. So anyway, okay, got to remember the original pitch, Star Trek, Hornblower in Space. 
maybe Hornblower in space. But let's be honest, and I say this with a lot of love for Hornblower, and um, the moment you start getting to the point at which the focus of the story is not Horn uh, not the first lieutenant, or even one of the junior lieutenants going up, it's um, a fixed crew of um, personalities. You are changing things. Veteran, Enterprise D would have been run better with Cap Data as Captain as Wolf as number one. They did suddenly do a good pairing. And on South, at Wolf 359, Starfleet meant to be lost over 10,000 officers. And, yeah, that sounds like a lot, but then you look at this, and you go thousands of planets. It's kind of like 40k. When you say you lose 10,000 people, that sounds like a lot, until you realise you're talking thousands of planets, each with billions of population. 10,000 is... It's not nice for the 10,000 loss, but it's not a... Oh, the... Starfleet is completely destroyed thing. As Sir began, uh, the Roman blockade was also towards the Klingon space, where the Federation maintains very little forces post Kidaba. Yeah, strange enough, they may they maintain very little forces, but suddenly have forty pretty much first class starships there. Sidrin 90. Commander Shan was supposed to join Archer's Enterprise crew in the cancelled last season Enterprise. Shame for misopportunity. That would have been cool. So big again. The we have outgrown conflict bit was partly why Q threw the Enterprise D into the path of the Borg cube. Yes, frankly, that was a necessary experience for the uh, for the Federation. Without that, they wouldn't have been ready in any way for the Dominion War. It's lovely when a plan of cues comes together. So, Shumran, I assume the energy resource requirements for transporting are so significant it may, to make it an active proposition to use it as uh, prolifically as a weapon is inefficient. To an extent. To an extent. This one. And some clerks being politely not talking about our ongoing discussion about the true horrors of how teleports were good to be used in war. I think the thing is, if you have teleporter technology, the moment you have it, someone's going to start working out how to disrupt it. And the thing is, shields are put to stop it, but also there's dampening fields and other systems which they tend to use to try and disrupt uh, it. But honestly, yes, you would use it. Then sure, we drew down our forces by the Klingon border and stored a starship replicator instead. You see, that's the other thing. I'm surprised the Federation hasn't put more money into developing a starship replicator. Uh, I, I don't see. Uh, I can see the difficulties and the power consumption and the issues with doing that, but. It would still be fun. Hmm. 
<laughs> Sorry. So Starfleet. Let's get into Starfleet. 24th century, Starfleet's ma um, mandate stated that no warships or ships designed purely for defense purposes would be built. However, this is one of the things I think you have to start thinking about with the Galaxy class. And in this picture, you can make out at least eight of them, uh, which suggests to me there's a lot more than uh, 13 Galaxy class being built by the time of the Dominion War, when this picture comes from. But the problem for the Federation <laughs> is that if you build a ship which is just a cruiser, that's purely a warship. But if you build a ship which has the firepower that it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Klingon strike cruiser, and then increase its size so it has the space for doing the exploration mission. Then you have a ship which has the space and hull that you could reconfigure into a capital ship or other things should you need for wartime. In peacetime, it's a cruiser. In wartime, it's the critical ship in your battle fleets. In wartime, they form... Galaxy wings, which sound suspiciously like, um, how do I put this politely, battleship divisions and squadrons. And uh, there are lines like, ah, those battleship, those galaxy wings are securing our flank. So basically, you have no worry about the entire enemy fleet trying to do something in the multi-dimensional nature of space of a space fight because there are four or five galaxies sitting on that wing yep okay those things have been upgraded Well, in DS9, they had self-replicating mines, courtesy of ROM. That was a fun one. So you know, just copy and paste security officers onto the enemy ship until the enemy ship isn't in the enemy ship anymore. That would be a fun one. Um, Verdon, I think Starfleet maintains a reserve fleet, given a lot of ships used in blockade were old. And as CG says, replicating a minefield somehow. Yeah, the thing is, again, that's another advantage you can do in space. If you can find a suitable storage site, you can theoretically saw these ships in space and they will be fine. It's, you know... What's going to happen to them if they're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of space? And if they're suitably... Basically, you have to have a suitable caretaker force around. So again, this might suggest that perhaps some of those deep space space stations or other space stations the Federation has are literally just hub points for reserve fleets. And again, if they do that, one of the things I'd like to find out is, does Federation have a reserve? Because... One of the things I put, I looked at was Starfleet Reserve Personnel when I was looking at this. And it led me to a very interesting sort of discussion on Memory Alpha, which of course is hmm, pretty much canon. And I was going through that, and I ended up on Reddit as well, and various other points. 
And it seems like, honestly, they don't have a reserve force. But do they need to? Because again, I refer you back to the size of the Federation. The sheer size of the force they're already going to have, and the backroom personnel, and probably the length of time of service, because some people have already brought up in various comments the age people live to, which seems to be a little bit more than most of us do. And if you consider, again, you've got the Vulcans, who tend to go join the service, go through one, to one service experience, leave the Starfleet for a many, for a few decades, and then come back and start all over again. And sort of go, hang on, weren't you an admiral about five or six decades ago? Yes, but now I'm an ensign. Really? Really? Okay. That could be freaking me out. They don't always get into that. So I, I think that's something which the various writers sometimes flirt with, and I just go... Mm -hmm. I don't, oh no, most of those aren't galaxy ships. They're ever so slightly different ship design. A bit like a different county class or leader. No, they're all galaxy class batches, but galaxy classes. Have a decision. Enjoy. That's good. Put a scanner on a battle cruiser. It's now a scanning vessel, but it has a second role in times of war. Federation President, why do you look so skeptical? Yeah, the whole time I'm reading descriptions of these ships, I keep thinking about HMS Unicorn for some reason. And if anyone is watching this and has never looked up HMS Unicorn, how do I explain it? HMS Unicorn is honestly not an aircraft carrier. She's a forward aviation support ship that the Royal Navy is building prior to World War II. That just happens to look exactly like a template for the light fleet carriers, which they churn out by the um, bag of sweetie load in during World War Two. Like, isn't the Sovereign class the new battleship equivalent in Time Memory Alpha? Does seem to call an assault cruiser. Sounds suspiciously like an old battle cruiser. Well, I'd throw about. Well, pretty much the Sovereign class coming to service after the experience of Wolf 359. And to an extent, they are... Ooh, how do I put this politely? They are a reaction to the experience of losing all those ships. But they do all sorts of things. And, I, you know, it's one of the interesting things, of course, they have the dividing ship and they have various other systems which come about. I'm not sure whether I'd call the Sovereign class a battleship, though. Because they're still being... They're still very much have got the space for diplomacy. They've got less in terms... They are... One of the things, thankfully, after Wolf 359, Starfleet does start to get away from it, is the idea of taking your entire family and children on a ship. And let's not forget, this is the organisation which sends ships off on solo missions to do five-year missions into space. Now, I know you can technically get your get your lovely big 
you're sort of you, you know you can break up your sort of your hull into two parts. I love the way you can the saucer section can break away and they can maneuver independently, but that doesn't make it two ships. And if you're sending a ship off into the unknown, you'd have thought the very basic would have been at least a backup would have been at least another a small ship bagging along with it. <laughs> um, and Andra Henderson puts a micros uh, microscope on battleship. Look, it's a research vessel with possibly excessive protection against polar bears. <laughs> yeah, that is that he would have done. So nice, Dan Henderson. If man were meant to fly across the universe, God would have allowed him to uh, assemble his own molecules. Hmm. The Klingons use Vorchers for long, uh, long range strategic server missions, basically explorer missions. Yeah. And that's always an interesting thing when you see a Vorcher turn up in a random place. See, I'm going to go. In theory, you could have put a starship in Ornery by removing all vacuum sensitive components and opening the airlock doors. Hard vacuum doesn't allow rust. Mm hmm. These chats always fall into the gap between scriptwriters and creating entertaining TV shows and fans trying to have those, those worlds make sense. Mm. Yep. A Serpic Icon. Note that for, except for a sovereign, all vessels designed in response to Borg threat were smaller than the galaxy. You could feasibly put in a commander or lieutenant commander in charge. Theoretically, and I would love to see it, but again... The Federation being the Federation, everything seems to end up being run by a captain. And other than Judzia Dax, who does seem to have fun taking command of a def of Defiant on occasion. Hmm. <laughs> Hello, Drac. Um, that, that 95. Also, they never mentioned any planetary militias or individual planet navies. Which you think some of the nation and some of the planets would have. And for example, we know the Vulcans have their own science fleet, which are possibly <clears throat> quite capable of fighting warships. Certainly seem to be in lower decks. To Senator, having an ensign on the ship that was an admiral 50 years ago, that will freak a captain out. I would think that he's judging me all the time. You wouldn't think he's judging you all the time. You know he's judging you all the time. Dragonaut, there is, of course, difference between the TNG galaxy and the DS9 refitted galaxy. Yes, the DS9 refitted galaxy is has basically gone from we've taken out all the bits which made us a cruiser slash almost cruise ship and turned ourselves into an actual functioning warship okay Here is the role comparisons. Are they cruisers? Well, Mem Memory Alpha describes them as an exploration cruiser. Beta, private generally seems to be a ship of exploration, but also extremely heavily armed. Memory Gamma, exploration cruiser. Well, let's go back to an age of sail, this sort of thing. If I'm sending a ship off on exploration, it's probably going to be a bigger ship in saying, to an extent, I'm either going to build a, use a very small but very very strong ship, i.e., a collier or a whale ship, or I'm going to use a large frigate that I'm going to reduce the number of guns on, so I have space for the labs, etc. 
And this is the thing. They have got a cruiser, a ship which is used as a cruiser, which is used as their large cruiser for going around doing their diplomacy missions. But it's almost like, and this is something which I do wonder when I consider the design process of the, of the galaxy, whether they actually had it in the mind of, right, well, if we need to, we can rip this bit out and turn it into a carrier for what our terms of carrier we need. If we need to, we can or we can take those bits out. We can put in more photon torpedoes, more more phasers, and we can add in maybe missile launchers. Oh, or we could add in troop quarters, or we could do this. And that's the thing. You've got all the space field. It's kind of like on the Type 45 destroyers, that their forward gym, which was put in the space for the VLS, and they're now losing it. The extra VLS space was a forward gym. It's a lovely space for the crew. We need more missiles. You're losing your forward gym. Enjoy. You have to go back to actually exercising with the Royal Marines. Oh. It was good leaving them with their own gym. It tortured us less. Yes, maybe, but now you're back to it. Enjoy. Right. Right. So, Rick Berman once said he doesn't know the difference between a phaser and a photon torpedo port. Uh, that's worrying if he doesn't. Director Faust, Sacrifice of Angels, aka the Galaxy Class Happy Fun Killing Time, where said ships appear to not care about the objective, just racking up the tally marks. Yeah, they do that pretty well. That's, of course, where I think this picture comes from. If we go back to it. Yeah. It's fun times. It certainly is fun. Does the warp drive access the quantum realm only in the first generation one, which is the, the uh, pre Federation Enterprise? That's good. But having two ships would mean the prop department would have to make two detailed models. Yes, and they might have to have a second captain, and they might occasionally have to have actual discussions between them. After all, Dax has been running around since the Federation since Captain Pike was a cadet. Yeah, that is the other trouble with Dax being a lowly officer in put in charge of the Defiant. Um, Dax has been served so many different times that whilst Jadzia Dax is new it's her, fir her first time around, the Dax Symbion has done this a few times before, and probably a few other things, and including if you consider what Curzon got up to. Cameron, I always wondered if Section 42 has an SSBN equivalent lo loaded with Genesis torpedo sitting somewhere. Vince Stewart. I expect the Vulcan science thing may be where the Federation got the idea. We are pacifists. This is a flashlight. That it can be focused enough to go straight through a planet is a bug, not a feature. I was asking, Andorians also have their guard, probably other species as well. Yes, although it would have been interesting to see some of them turn up in some of the big battles. I see them going, yeah, Steo, the Catalans have a fleet of their own, including a home brewed carrier. Oh, always nice. A Serbic icon. Mr. Uh, TNG hand phases literally has shielding and sensor functions. Hmm. Oh. Uh, seriously, some of the phases heck. Yeah. Oh, I, I still cannot believe the episode in Deep Space Nine where they had that rifle, which was a transporter rifle, and basically was just putting its bullet, uh, uh, you know, by transporter metric at the target. And you sit there and go, Yeah, why did it take you so long to think of that? And also, why aren't you deploying these? Seriously, is it because they're too mean to your opponents?
Dirk Scott, how do you put a kill ring marker in a ship mounted phaser? You don't, but you do put the plasma conduits that they wear out firing their phasers. You take them out of the ship and you put them in a nice little section in your ready room, your sort of area where your people or your crew get together and have food and relax and rest so that they can all see with pride how many times they've worn out their own weapons firing at the enemy. Because that's the more peaceful version of it, you know. Not marking the kills. Marking how many times we blast the enemy with our weapons. Afrobeat, I would be curious to know your thoughts about the Excelsior class. They seem to turn up everywhere you look. Yeah, it's... The thing is, you start to get the impression that whilst the Galaxy class might have been stopped at 13, sort of, honestly, Gov, 13 was all we built, honestly, uh, and we only built, like, seven of them properly. The other six are all components. Don't... Yeah, yeah th those are just spare sources over there, Gov. They're not, they're not more galaxies than six. No, no. We don't, we don't actually have about two to three dozen galaxies over there ready to churn out. No, no, no. It was only six, Gov. It's only six, we promise. Yells Elsias are sort of a case of, we will build them. We will build them. If we keep building them, they don't know. We just build them. They all look the same. They're not the biggest. That's the galaxy, you know. So we will build them. At... It's kind of like the Arleigh Burks. They just keep building Excelsiors. And at some point, it's, it turns into the Royal Navy with cruiser squadrons, where a Starfleet Admiral turns around to another and goes, we just fought a battle, apparently, in this sector. Did we? Yes. All the ships. This, this, this. They're all Excelsiors. I didn't know we had Excelsiors in that sector. I didn't know we had those ships. We won. Did we? Good. Does anyone know how they ended up there? Does anyone know why they were there? Does anyone know who was in command of them? No, no, no. Okay. Chris, obviously, it would make sense if the Federation Mothball fleet were basically just hulls and engines with no internal fittings. So refit into whatever is needed doesn't mean ripping out previous stuff. Yes. Tracking mode, kind of point. Invoking consistency lesson. Anything powerful enough to be a starship drive is powerful enough to be a weapon. Quite possible. Cam Gasman, read vacuum storage fleet. Uh, cosmic radiation might eat your hull if powered down. Well, you probably have to keep a care, as I said, caretaker. So for so, you probably have to keep the sort of the plates char, uh, the the hull plating charge to extend and polarize. So, generally, with the destruction of Romulus, do you think the Federation will say the Treaty of Aldebaran is now void and start equipping cloaking devices on mass? Uh, there was a whole debate on that one. Hello, boy Drax are just having his dinner. I have, you know, there's me sitting here starving, living you off had sweets. Dinner. Yes, I have had some. I had some lunch, not not dinner. <laughs> um, you know, he, he he he's having dinner just a few minutes away from me. Well, I'm looking out in the garden. So... Yeah, but that's because you haven't got your jobs done today. Uh, but I can note. Uh, second point: How much energy is needed to give a six average human some energy? And they can do d uh, that from a station orbit. That's a lot. It's a lot of energy. It's a lot. Oh, no. uh, so, okay, come. Unloaded photon torpedo cases. Unloaded photon torpedo casings are about as safe as you can get. The most dangerous thing inside is the battery until you fuel the thing. Hmm. So, the Marines are the main enterprise here at the Makos. Yeah, and the Makos are really quite useful. I, again, something Starfleet's missing. A proper ground force. You know, the, the, the classic example is Deep Space Nine's Dominion War. They're going to their listening post and they're securing it. And all the troops 
are in their red and yellow uniforms and they're fighting Dominion troops which have personal cloaking devices. And you sit there and go, have none of you ever heard of the word camouflage? Anyone? How about a prepared fighting position that isn't just sitting behind the nearest piece of wood? I mean, you could do some digging. You could put in some concrete. I don't know. Even better, you could funnel it down so that they can't get these floating cloaked mines to actually come in. You could put a door. I saw a bigger kind of effect. Hero ship uh, like Drat of Fiant painted an exterior kill mark every time they kill the ship. They would look like a da like Dazzle Cam on no time. Yeah. Do you realize you've got two eyes looking at you from the other side of that door? Yes. I, I, I have heard. I think you all might be getting a miss uh, a visit from a fluffy research assistant. <laughs> Hello. Yes, fluffy research assistant has joined us to say hello. Ugh. Right. If you want to go, uh, if, you, if you want to go trophy hunting, you could always go through the debris field looking for ship name plaques to put behind the bar and turn forward. Yeah. Um, I, I said a big icon. Not all the Excel cells look the same. Long live the Enterprise B. Uh. Georgian, if you don't keep building ships, you lose the skill set to build them. True. Connor B J B Stellar Parks. Hello. Uh, do you think the Federation Klingons have an arms for a control treaty after Kimmer? Less ships, but ending up being bigger to compensate for less. I don't think they do because, again, if we go back to this map, you could only having an arms control treaty between the two of you would be great, but you have all those other powers around you. So Neva's going to actually do that. That's the thing. Unless you could get everyone else to sign up to that treaty, you're not going to do that. What are you sniffing at? You're up to something. Are you hunting something? Oh, you're hunting. No, you're not allowed that. That's not good for fluffy things. I'm going to put that down on the floor for you to lie on. Come in here, reorganise my entire office. You are such a flop. Uh, Daddy Hooks, in the nicest way, uh, the turbo laser is not an energy weapon, it's a plasma cannon. A slow, low energy plasma cannon. Well, even the phase cannons of the NX-01 are all far more accurate and longer range. True. Star Wars doesn't have anti-weapons, just nukes. Hmm, to an extent, yeah. Alex Reverdon, the Excelsius were upgraded with Dominion Threat Quantum Torpedoes. More shield and phaser power. If, if it's a good ship, why not refit after all? Yep. Nathan Brown, Excelsius are almost as old as Miranda's. I think they are the, they're the mothball fleet. They were built when the Federation was in the Clone Cold War, or Second Cold War, or whatever it was called. They were certainly around a lot of them. Then it's transport and rifles not divided deployed because the transporter inhibitors are easy. They are easy, but then why develop in the first place? But uh, yeah, I still think the rifle would have been useful.
As Serpic so Income, that grand battle episode is worse than you remember. The contingent is the crew of a starship, along with the captain. Yeah, I, I do remember that. And then Next Generation, the replacements for them are fresh out cadets who have just turned up. And again, still, they have no ground forces commander or ground forces specialist. They are just using starship captains, who again, are magically well known for their ability to fight actual land battles. Because fighting, uh, fighting in space on a ship is going to equip you for fighting a land battle where gravity becomes not just an occasional factor, but the overwhelming factor. Then, for him, but Starfleet can't train people for ground combat. Where would they do it? On the holodeck? Yeah, lots of things can be done on holodeck. Bigger riches. Why fight when you can pay someone tough to do food? Works well, apparently. Hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you for the O Canada. War has, let's say, war trains in the whole duck, and so does Guinan. Yesterday's Enterprise is another timeline. Yeah, unfortunately, it is. See, I've always thought that the Trek versus Wars conflict comes down to the personnel. And the Empire has terrible personnel. Promotion because angry man with red laser sword choked the other guy. That works. Uh, Definitely. Welcome to today's lesson in how to get biscuits from your pink blob. Mm -hmm. It works. Uh, Siege United. They only go to war in DS9 when the Klingons invade Cardassia. Not because uh, not not be they become allies again once the Dominion intervenes. Yep. In, I was asking, in short, Starfleet is on a systemic level so incompetent in combat, both ship and ground, that it's a miracle they actually win something. Yes, it all comes down to the crews, and you do sometimes wonder whether they write it that way, so that it's crew, not the ship, even though the ship should be the star of the show, because the ship is frankly looks fantastic. But no, it's going to be the crew that saves the day. So some arms do get limited by Kinema Cords. Subspace weapons, for example, as the Sona, having them as mentioned. Yeah. But that's not the same. It's kind of like limiting cruisers in the Washington Treaty. If you read it, you're limited to 10,000 tons for a cruiser. You aren't limited in how many you can build. You could build as many as you like. George Newman, on a tangent of keeping skill sets, it is estimated that the US Army has already built over three times the number of M1A1 Abrahams they think they will need before next generation tanks comes out. Hmm. It keeps things going. Mr. At least it's better than Space Above and Beyond, where they use Starfighter pilots as, above, uh, as ground troopers. Oh. Just off. As much as I love the DS9 episode, Siege of AR-558, the Federation gives you one if they bought in a couple of heavy machine guns. Yeah. Again, this is the thing. You're fighting ground combat. Where are your crew served weapons? Where are they? You probably need them. some heavy-duty phase guns. Rapid-firing heavy-duty phase guns. Just concentrate on the target. Remote control. Set and going. Space Above and Beyond were Space Marines, and Marines' legacy is that every Marine is a rifleman before everything. Hmm. I I'm get not getting into that one. I I I've prepped for Trek today. That was good. Wars versus Trek discussion on personnel. They both lose 40,000. Neither shows security detachments are expected to be ready to fight off demo demonic incursions every intersystem trip. Hmm. Yeah. They both lose to 40k. Well, let's be honest. Space Marines are an argument for many, many things. They tend to win the arguments. 
Right. So the Galaxy class began development in 2343. Gained the Julius distinction of having the longest design, development, and construction period of any class in Starfleet up to that point. The prototype USS Galaxy launched in 2357, and its first two sister ships, the USS Enterprise D and USS Yamata, followed six years later in 2364. A, I'd like to point out that Yamato doesn't have a letter after its name. So they've obviously changed its registry number from the previous one. It's not maintaining the same registry number. And yeah. The first thing you start to go for Galaxy Class, and this, please excuse me if I upset people with this, but I'm going to say this. They have such long development. It means they're not, it obviously means they're not going to be a straightforward design. Because if even if you're building an exploration cruiser, which is just meant to be an exploration cruiser, you've pretty much built those things before. Yes, you're scaling up the size. Yes, you're putting in new engines and new systems. But none of that's really going to take time. However, designing a system which is very plug and play does show, diffi uh, show difficulty. For example, if the Americans had just made for the Ford class basically an improved version of the, of the Nimitz class, they would have been quite easy and quick to produce. But because they decided to make everything in them plug and play, so they are very adaptable for future, this is what's made the Ford class quite so expensive and quite so time consuming to get into service. It happens. Cheer guy, Galaxy Class Yamato was seen in two episodes of two different registry numbers. That's because they produced another one that they called Yamato after the first one was blown up. As I was asking, Crown Comet, some armored vehicles maybe? We see one in uh, Star Trek Nemesis. Armed, yes. Armored? No. Just a cage that exposes the crew. Uh, my memory of looking at that was going, oh, you've been playing Halo. That particular vehicle. Imagine if there were aliens who could come down to Earth and say, I'm going to stop this instant slaughter, then snap their fingers and bring the war in Ukraine to a halt. Why are they just focusing on one war, then? There are lots of wars they could be bringing to a halt at the same time. And if they could, snap by snapping their fingers, that would be amazing. But that would suggest a level of either mind control or uh, other form of coercion. Probably not gonna. It's either going to enslave the entirety of the human race, or it's not going to be good. Either way, not a good scenario. As much as we might like peace. So, the galaxy class design. Sometimes. A server game comes from the TNG deck, deck, deck menu. There are actually long lead time items to starships. The galaxy is required developing the tech to casting the largest warp, core, warp field cores of time. All true, but again, not so true. Because whilst they are long lead items and certainly provide a very reasonable reason for this, not that we're preparing them for being able to be converted to capital ships or carriers or other scenarios should we need. No, no, no. Um, it's still looks kind of fishy <laughs> because it's not that new age that's what I was thinking. Queen Elizabeth class a, a carrier took 10 from contract launch 14 years doesn't seem that much yeah honestly it really doesn't when you start comparing it to these things but you know that's life Okay. Now, of course, my Bible for this is this book, Shipyards by Star, uh, Star Trek Shipyards. And I have to say, I use it a lot. Mainly because you need to try and understand the way these things are built is interesting to me. 
it also allow me to, how do I put this politely, look at the, uh, <clears throat> well, the Nebula class. Because let's be honest, that's just weird. That, th this design looks weird. It looks like someone's taken a galaxy, uh, the bits of a galaxy and just rejigged them. Which, of course, they did do. And added something on the top. Enterprise D was an awe inspiring technical achievement that was a result of 20 years of development work from the finest engineering minds of the Federation Advanced Ship Desi Starship Design Bureau, including Dr. Leah Brahms. It was largely responsible for the design of the warp engines. The Enterprise D followed the same basic design layout as the previous Enterprises, but it was sleeker. Due to advancements in hyperflight uh, hyper dynamics, and the saucer section was larger in proportion to the secondary or engineering hull. At 641 meters in length and with 42 decks covering 3.5 million square meters, it had eight times as much interior space as the Captain, uh, Captain Kirk's Enterprise. This meant there was 110 square meters of living space per person. Wow. And how much of that living space is going to be used to actually support me and keep the ship moving? The facilities on board included three sick bays, 20 transporter systems, and more than 100 research labs dedicated to disciplines such as stellar cartography, exobiology, cybernetics, astrophysics, geosciences, archaeology, cultural anthropology, and botany. This is a ship which is built to explore. Also, that's a lot of space which can be adapted for other things. The Enterprise D had a crew of 1,012, which included a significant number of civilians, such as Mott the, ba uh, the Bolian Barber and the botanist Kira, uh, Kiko O'Brien. As you would expect on a Federation ship, the Enterprise D's crew was made up of people from many different plants and species. In 2366, there were said to be 13 different species on board, while in 2369, there were 17 members of the crew from non-Federation worlds, including the Bajoran Rolaran. Very nice. Then, of course, we have the Miranda class, USS Saratoga. Take care, Miss Richards. Enjoy. Good luck, Glenn. So you remind, well, the Organians effectively did that to the Klingons of Federation. They did to an extent. Then there's a whole computer game, um, Starfleet Command Gold Edition, where they're basically they their disappearance is the entire um, main story behind many of the missions. The Romulan two-man ship from Nemesis was nice, but what if it had polarized armor and shields and a turret with phaser and rail cannons and some missiles? That would have been useful. Strasium, the game was called Star Trek New Worlds and was a Red Alert style game where you did have a specialist ground equipment from the Fed. The Feds, the uh, Federation, the, Ro the Romulans, and the Klingons. <whistles> Same with them. No objection. Nebulas are pretty. They're, they might be pretty, but they're ugly. They're ugly. They're weird. It can be pretty, and it can be ugly. I think I have a deck by deck design blueprint somewhere for the Enterprise D, although I did re didn't realize how many fricketing massive how fricketing massive the thing was until recently. Yeah, it is a very big ship. That's the other reason why people tend to go, Cru they can't be a cruiser because they're so big. No. Cruisers were often bigger than battleships. Especially if we look in the exploration period, the cruisers tended to be bigger. 
Take care in a minute, Darren. Good luck with the thunderstorm. Now there's re four class. On the other hand, while the four probables are pain in the stern, the whole class lifetime cost might be better than the Nimitz classes. I'm sure they will be. Especially their adaptability, because it will require less massive refits to change things around. Dan Freeman, welcome to the Stellar Cartography Lab. We studied the view in great detail, so we can spot cloaked ships disrupting this. Mm-hmm. Dan Freeman, Bottling and Life Sciences Labs, or how to kill interesting new species we encounter. Dan Freeman, this is the device we use to prepare materials for the mass spectrometer. It is excessive to call it a massive sight phaser cannon. It just happens to look and function like one. So we reckon, oh my god, uh, uh, Starfleet Command franchise back when Star Trek games are dead. It was an interesting one. <laughs> Those aren't the battalion of elite marines. They just research assistance with a keen interest in personal fitness. I love this show. So, you know, I've looked, compared a Southampton to an Iron Duke in War Thunder. Southampton looks more bulky and is almost long. Drakenrad, hello. Queen Elizabeth was built by a semi muffled shipbuilding industry. Galaxy came from a fleet building program that had built and launched Excelsior variants ambassadors up to three years prior to launch. Yeah. That's the other advantage. And also, once they've done development, they do build the ships very, very quickly, which does, again, to me, belie some of the ideas about how long the development takes. It seems to me, and this is, again, the naval historian coming from me, you've got a functioning industry, you've got functioning infrastructure, and the Federation, let's be honest, has lots of both to support their construction. And it not only takes the time it takes, but when they come out, they immediately go, where? Oh, yes. Where do we... Let, let's consider, who else in the past habit was, had a habit of sending their newest, greatest, sexiest looking cruisers straight to disputed territories to remind their opponents, ju potential opponents, just how capable they were? Oh, that was the British. The county class went straight to the Far East. So did the, the town class um, light cruisers. Those one sort of 12, 6 inch guns. And where are the galaxies? Where is Yamato? Where is uh, Enterprise headed off to? Oh, they're off not far from the Romulan neutral zone, where they go and they, they, they end up tracking down Iconian, you know, archaeology and having an interesting confrontation with the Romulans. That used to be the good thing about Star Trek Fleet Command. You could actually use the sensor probes as torpedoes if you reconfigure them. It worked quite well. As uh, okay, on. cybernetic and AI labs. Definitely not cracking your com code sensors and jammer techniques. It, there is a lot of use for those scientists. A lot of use for them. So yes, space does give them a lot of opportunities and does give them a lot of options for being for when I say this, for being galaxy class. But they also have this. This of course is the heavy cruiser refit, which we see when Riker turns up to pull Picard out of a Q inspired issue. Mm. 
Now, of course, a third nacelle has been added. Always nice to have a third nacelle. Various heavy phases have been added. Again, nice to have them. But again, one of the things you notice when you start looking at this design, and I hope you agree with me on this, because otherwise I'm going to have to have a conversation about it, um, is that you sit there and go, hang on. This hasn't actually taken as much work as you might think it should have done. Almost as if, again, it's one of the things which is prepped for in the Starfleet universe. And it's one of the interesting questions, of course, because you always have to do, talk about the pre uh, the prepping in two levels. You're talking about this when I'm doing historical analysis. I'm also I am to some extent suspending the fact that I realise that it's written by a whole load of screenwriters and set designers, etc., who produce these and some very very skilled model builders. And you have to look at it and evaluate it from the ship, like you would the they and they uh, the sort of like you would a, a, an actual warship, a modern warship, and you go. Right then, what does this tell us about the country behind it? And what the whole thing that Galaxy Class screams the whole way through, what they scream is this is designed by people who are very much preparing for the worst case scenario. They don't know what that worst case is going to be, but they know it might come. And they know that they can't, if they build a ship as a full up warship, then they have to do a lot more work to reconfigure it than ripping out lamps. And I think to an extent, the whole peace, our ships are peace, ships of peace, our explorer ships works for them in terms of building this, uh, this ship, which is a sort of, in many ways, the bare bones of a capital ship as well. Because it means you can adapt it quite quickly and quite easily when you need to. Every time I look at the Galaxy, every time I look at the Galaxy class, I can't help but rem rem uh, remake the neck so the primary hull is just below the nacelles, and the deflector incorporate incorporated in the bottom of the primary hull. Ye, I you're turning it into almost a sovereign class. Well done. I think it takes so long, Barshi, because the Galaxy Class is the next step in that with naval building. Perhaps not a dreadnought warrior step, but maybe a queue for Federation showing its part. I think it's, uh, I think it's to an extent that, but I think it's also to an extent they're building this ship to be able to be easily reconfigured, and that takes a lot more time. You have to plan out the power lines and the internal systems far more carefully. That's good. Why do ships always meet each other the same direction being up? Um, again, that's television, not reality. Now, Trim, exactly how many of those spaces now taken up <coughs> additional weapons? Which is just storeroom, sphere, combination act. It's amazing. So much of them was. There's a theory that the AGT um, galaxy had just had refit had three nacelles to eventually intentionally break existing design convention. The show uh, given a sense that this is from the wrong future. Yeah, but it's also the easiest way to actually actually make your ships more um, as sort of viable in terms of speed. But also, if I was I have to admit, if I was going to do a free nacelle um, galaxy, it would be I would drop down the other two, so I would make them lower. 
make it more difficult for someone to line up a hit to attack all three of them in one go. And TOS, uh, GeoGuy, TOS had three nacelled constitutional based dreadnought design that was never seen on screen. Yeah, I, I think basically when they start heavying ships up, a third nacelle is what tends to come in. It's it's the war fit rather than the peacetime fit. Again, that does make sense because, you know, having a third nacelle gives you that much more redundancy. So, Akon, if the galaxy is that modular, then its power system is overbuilt. You have to have a large power conduct running to living areas in case you need it for whatever war mod. Well, of course you would, but just think about it. You probably have to have your shield generators spaced throughout your ship, etc. All sorts of systems, and labs could require all sorts of power, couldn't they, Acerbic Akon? So, you need to have heavy duty power for them. And, well, then you might as well just standardize the conduits, because, you know, that's easier to maintain in space if they're all standardized conduits. And layouts. Citroen 19. Well, in DS9, Cisco had Trilithium on hand to attach to photon torpedoes that could make a planet unhabitable, and that was on a much smaller ship. Hmm. Imagine what they have on the bigger ships. Excuse me a second. Fluffy research assistant has just jumped up and is currently looking out the window, and before he busts through to go after the squirrel, I am going to let him out. Okay, you. Where are you off to? Squirrel hunt. Okay, come on, back in. Here you go. Here you go. Yes, biscuit, and you've got my fleeces to lie on the floor on. Come on. That makes you happy. That does make you happy. Okay. All right. Good fluff. Good fluff. Sorry about that, Iron. Also, Reliant based or not, Adamant class. Actually, I know, oh, oh, it wouldn't be the first time they were power systems were overbuilt, given, though, given how much the uh, power that CVN 65 had. No, you, you trust me, you do not want this. This stuff is definitely not good for a fluffy puppy. Uh, let's see. When it came to sci-fi ships just look mean and look like they are about to uh, throw down, I love the EA Nova and the EA Omega. Mm. In Battleship, uh, from uh, uh, Babylon 5. Mm. That's good. You also need heavy panning as a backup system in the case the primary systems get damaged, of course. Just a coincidence that they go past the enemy spaces where weapons fit. 
Let me guess. Well, Garen, you have to also have to do the destruction. Uh, distru uh, also have the destruction of the ambassador class C playing into design presses. You also have to ask why the old ambassadors aren't used in the uh, Dominion War. Hmm. To an extent, I wonder if the reason they're not used is because they are actually not active or act able to be activated. There is part of me which sits there and looks at some of them and goes, do you have the crews? It, there is the, the Dominion jab that Starfleet is still whirring up its crews. And again, this is the point I think about when it comes to reserves, etc. I don't think Starfleet has a reserve program. I think they should have a reserve program. I think it'd be sensible. And I think they do use their size and depth reserves, but they presume they're going to be able to recruit people. They don't really know they're going to have the recruitments. And I can understand also there could be an issue with getting reserves in that, you know, people might go, oh, well, do we want them having reserves? Because that's becoming very militaristic. But there's also part of me which rather likes reserves because I think reserves are a good counter to military and um, militarism in that reserves in my mind mean that your military force is never really strong enough without activating a load of civilians and turning them into forces to do that job to take things over and if they have to do that then they have to tell people what they're doing and also reservists let's put it this way the military personnel themselves aren't likely to want to do a push but reservists are going to make that even more difficult because it's going to be a case of you in, in the nicest way. They don't, you know, the, the thing about being a professional military is that is your, to an extent, if you're a professional Navy or all these things, it's your life. It's everything you have in you. A reservist, of course, automatically has things outside it. They have another working profession. So to an extent, the military uh, deci them deciding to not do something, as in we won't take part in the push, is almost. I don't want to say easier. But they don't even have the second hesitation what do I do if I'm kicked out of the military for this? And especially, uh, this is more me thinking in terms of not on Earth military, but in terms of a wider space galactic empire. That becomes a factor. So, Junaiti, I like how in TOS the Romulan warboat uh, is equipped with nuclear missiles. Hmm. Also, Cisco Punch Q. I'm not Picard. I, I do like Cisco. Cisco is one of my favourite captains. I, I'm Pike. I'm sort of finding interesting. I like him, but there's also Palmich thinks that he's not yet his own captain. Janeway is probably my favourite captain. I'm fairly certain that if she ever heard that Cisco had Punch Q. She'd probably be buying Cisco drinks for life and going, Why did I never think of doing that? Oh, I did. I slapped him. But yes, to the club of We Punched You. And Picard goes, But I hugged him. You're not allowed in the club. You're not allowed. No, no. You either have to have punched, hit in some way, or tried to kill Q in order to be in this club. If you've hugged him and merely tolerated his presence, then you are far too nice and have far too much. A far too much of a, you know, patience. So, Nelson, real question of which the Roddenberry ships would win, the Galaxy class or the Glorious Heritage class, as both are also cruisers, professional crews from the same great mind. Oh, I have no doubts about which would win. I'm sorry, I'm going for a Glorious Heritage. Yes, this is phases and photon torpedoes, and those are absolutely amazing things, and it will they those they, they will cause a lot of damage. But uh, glorious heritage has <clears throat> fighters.
Republic Starwing, I like to hear this, but um, I have little cousins watching this. So, yeah, someone just let it through, but still, little cousins watching it, so can we keep it polite, because I will get a neck from the elder cousins who are their parents. John Sowers, the U.S. Zukov is an ambassador class that is seen in the S9. Hmm. Anyway, USS Galaxy. Uh, the original Enterprise. And here is actually pictured taking part in the attack, the Battle of Cardassia, I think it is, because that's a Cardassian defense system which is focusing on it. All we know really about her is that she took part in the first Battle of Chintoa and the Battle of Cardassia. She's in DS9's Tears of the Prophets and What You Leave Behind. She's then assigned to Starfleet Battle Group Omega to engage the Reman Warbird Scimitar. However, of course, Scimitar is destroyed before US Enterprise E uh, by US Enterprise E before the Battle Group saw action. It's great when you have a uh, prototype ship which is so easily able to be upgraded and into uh, go to frontline combat. Rafa, is it? Good afternoon. You're going to have to explain why Janeway is your favourite. Okay. If I wanted an admiral, the admiral would be Cisco. If I wanted a ship's captain, I'd probably pick Janeway. Because... She treats her Ractogeno like I treat my Iron Brew. And I'm sorry, I don't... I, I, I respect people more if they have a drink which they're mildly addicted to. Sorry, I was hoping Little Cousins can't read. They're not that little. They're definitely not that little. What do you mean? Jane was an excellent captain, let down my plot driven writing. Her portrayal is very inconsistent. Yeah, I did have problems with the plot on occasion. I think they lost the plot where it came to Janeway. I don't think they were really care uh, sure how to handle a female captain. I'm um, uh, Hmm. That is the other thing, of course, when Cisco, of course, who's the prophet and the, well, the emissary, hits Q. Is that one god hitting another god, or is that, I don't know what it is. Hang on, is Cisco's hit, is the impact of one god hitting another god the reason why eventually Q is going to dies in this sort of Picard? Is that the reason for Q's death? The whack, the punch landed on him by another god? <laughs> Going on, given that Cisco cooks Hungarian food when he's in a good mood, he bought me. Yeah. There are some good captains out there, but again, this is the thing. And something which you have to consider with a Star Trek scenario is that they have these ships which are floating around, which are, as some people already said, hotel cruise liners in space. And yet they're also supposed to be taken seriously as warships. And yes, that's part of their diplomatic mission. That is part of their diplomatic mission. But... It, there's more and more, I think, after the Kitten Accords, but before Wolf 3, 2359, um, 2359, the Federation is sort of drowning in its own hubris. It believes it stopped wars. It's believed it's better. Mm. 
Present. Not that I wonder, uh, want to deal with bots, but I sometimes wonder what the unmoderated chat looks like. At the moment, to be fair, it's quite a lot of people mostly just talking normally. Dr. Clark, Siska is a demigod. His father was human. Yeah, but so were people like Hercules, etc. demigods, and they're still slayed god -like gods. That's good. I thought the cube continued to be dying for a long time. Yes, but what was the impact of that punch? And also, if the cube continues dying, what's happened to Q's son? Because Q did have a child. Uh, uh, has he died as well? Or is he the last remaining Q? In which case, I'm really worried. Because that was one interesting young man. Excellent. Lorca is basically a tribal captain. Lorca is... Well, let's be honest. Lorca is someone from the alternate universe. He's from the Terran Empire, so he acts like it. And USS Challenger. NCC-71099. Um, she was one of several ships which were involved in the intercepted... The Borg Transworld con a transport conduit that carried USS Voyager back to the Alpha Quadrant. And at certain points in her history, theoretically, in an alternate timeline, USS Challenger, commanded by Captain Geordi LaForge in 2390, is the vessel assigned to pursue and capture the Delta Flyer which had been stolen by a former Voyager crew members, Shakote and Harry Kim. If you're getting feedback, I think that's because my mum my mom or someone is using the camera in my room to watch me. So there is another camera up there. The Challenger managed to um, actually cause a warp breach, a warp core breach on the flyer. But Kim did, of course, send back the successful instructions to collapse the slipstream and avert the disaster. I said, okay, come on. Pre World 359 it is the head of Federation edging towards a post history fleet doctrine. Uh, yeah. That's good. I thought the son decided to be mortal. Um, I don't think he did. I think he still hanged around. He was definitely uh, Q. Definitely wandered long. Excellent. Yes, but the Terrans are basically British Empire, but slightly more insane. Oh, they're not the British Empire. No, no, they're something far worse than the British Empire. Let's be honest. The Federation is theoretically a democrat slash socialist run United States. The Terran Empire is the Soviet Union. Have a look at the way they're described. Have a look at the way they're talked about. The British Empire, it's not the British Empire, it's the Soviet. As I said, the system's Commonwealth are the British Empire in space. They're the British Commonwealth in space. They're quite literally the British Commonwealth in space. Terran Empire or the Soviet Union. Colin Cameron, so the doc is suggesting the Duke of Venner could have killed Q. If anyone's likely to have killed Q, the Duke of Venner is high on my list. Let's be honest, it is the Duke of Edinburgh. So, you know, the ending was really uh, pretty bad with DS9. Kind of ruined Goldacart as a character. Yes, it did ruin Goldacart as a character, especially when he could have been pretty darn useful 
in helping the reconduction, uh, reconstruction of Cardassia after he'd probably done time in jail somewhere. Nathan Brown, have the Q been dying for a long time because they got punched in the future by a godlike being with a tenuous connection to causality? Potentially. Rapper is Dr. Clark, why the Galaxy class of all Star Trek's Enterprises are classified as, uh, as cruisers? Well, the Galaxy class I picked because, honestly, it's the most contentious debate on whether they're a cruiser or not. But I will probably, as time goes on, I will do more sci-fi ships in these sort of reviews. And I'm trying to think what I'm going to do next year in terms of ships. And the trouble is, Glyn isn't here now, so I can say this. There is just not enough th material, really, on Glyn's ships. If I had more designs for Glyn Stewart's ships, especially his battle cruisers, I would certainly consider capital ships for next year and, and put those in that. But it's it's working out what I'm doing. I, I'm, I'm working through, and one of the things I'm going to be doing while I'm in Canada is coming up with next year's theme and deciding on it. And I know I'm going to be deciding on next year's theme while touring a destroyer and a cor and a corvette. But seeing as my current writing projects are on corvettes, sloops, and also admirals, I'll probably want to avoid that because I want something fun and different uh, for me to be doing on the channel as my regular videos. So I'm not sure what I'm going to go with. I'm 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 going to be thinking it through while I'm in Canada. So probably the people in Canada who I end up mumping into out there are going to find me asking some really random questions while I'm trying to figure it out. And the people in the UK when I start doing tour, uh, advertising where I'm being in the UK when I'm going on research trips are going to go. I'll be doing research here. If you'd like to meet for food, I will be here. Is Trelena Q? I think he could have been, but that's my personal view. Alexander, the Terran Empire USSR connection does make sense, even if only because Lorca is also George I. Zukov. Yep. Alexander, your arguments about the guys' class as cruisers are compelling. Thank you. I said, Big Egon, to be fair, the Duke be, be, uh, Ducat uh, being Putin prefer. Uh, Prefab logically leads into to, uh, to cat being put in postfab. Narcissism is narcissism. Uh, yeah. Or is it the ships at the expense could be a lot of fun? Yeah, but that'd be a lot of capital ships. And that would be quite good, but there again, it's working through the capital ships. And the trouble is, my favourite ship from the uh, from the um, expanse is definitely not a capital ship. How about carriers? And you get all the new Battlestar Galactica as well as Star Wars. Well, that's a good idea, but the trouble with carriers is, if you think about it, I have 52 weeks roughly in a year. Now, admittedly, I do special. Uh, the, the, the December doesn't count, because December I do different stuff in them. So that actually takes it down roughly to 48 weeks in a year. Okay, so 48 weeks... 48 classes of carriers. Mm, I, I'm going through the numbers of aircraft carrier types in my head. I don't think we've reached 48 classes of aircraft carriers. And I'd have, that's including going up to right to modern day. So that's a bit of a problem with aircraft carriers. Doing... Capital ships. Also, there was the fact that last year was sort of the year of the Dreadnought, and given a lot of Dreadnought stuff uh, on sort of the capital ships in the prior World War One and World War One. So there is plenty going. If I'm going to do capital ships, which ones am I going to do? I'm going to do carriers. I'm going to. It's working it through. There's there's ideas going around. 
There's also the idea of doing the year of submarine, but the trouble is the pictures are just not that good. Uh, just not that good. USS Odyssey. Now, Odyssey is most famous for being blown up spectacularly. She is. I would also argue she is put forward in the most stupidly organized task group ever known to mankind. And I kid you not. This is coming from someone who's a historian who has, who as a historian has studied the Royal Navy's approach to uh, naval deterrence, naval diplomacy, the Japanese approach, the American approach throughout history and the French approach as well. And a fair amount on the Swedish and the da Danish and the various other the Baltic nations approach to naval diplomacy as well. And the most consistent thing I can find is this. Okay. You have two choices when you're dealing with a threat you know. You go in comically under or comically over capable. Under capable or over capable. Sing Townsend. It's technically a large light crew, a light a light cruiser, but it, it might be a large ship, but it's a light cruiser and a sloop against three heavy cruisers. It's almost dismissive. It's enough force they're not going to bowl it over, but it's not so much force that it's actually it's a threat to them. Or you turn up with everything. When you don't know your threat. You judge it by the scenario and by the actions of the opponent. If they've acted polite and honest, you act polite and honest and you send the minimal force. If they've something done something aggressive, i.e. kidnapped one of your senior officers, then you sharp with capabilities. Sending in a solo a single galaxy class with some runabouts as a her as a rest of a task group is basically asking to get wiped out. Hi, Strana. Yeah, so, but Gagon, there's actually a novel where Q basically says Trelane is his legitimate son with another eldritch being. That's fun to think about. Kevin, hi, Dr. Clark. Kirk Spock's solving of the Khan two-dimensional thinking in Star Trek II is it believable that someone like Khan, who's super intelligent, would be as bad at combat tactics or not? Honestly, I have met some very smart people who are excellent at strategy, but who are not really good at the nuts and bolts of combat, of actual fighting. They do all the strategy of organizing the fight and basically appear doing it, but they don't it actually don't get let them anywhere near the actual fight. But then you have other people who specialize in that because usually the more intelligent people you're dealing with, the more they specialize. So there is the strategist and there is the combat type. There are people who do both. Trust me, there are. They are the unicorns and they are very special. But I think the main trouble with Khan is because he's so intelligent and so smart, he tends to presume he's the smartest person in the room. And would never ask himself the question of, what happens if I'm not the smartest person around? Or if someone else is almost as smart as me? So, 19, perhaps you could consider Mass Effect, where they have delineation between dreadnoughts and cruisers and even ca carriers. Hmm. Isaac, look like it wouldn't make a year, but ships named Enterprise could be fun. Yeah. Anyway, so here's what happens to the Odyssey. Odyssey arrived at Deep Space Nine in 2370 under the command of Captain Kuf. It's on a mission on the Cardassian border when it's called to Deep Space Nine because the Jem'Hadar had taken Commander Benjamin Sisko prisoner in the Gamma Quadrant. With news of this, wormhole traffic course is suspended and the Odyssey is ordered to proceed into the Gamma Quadrant to investigate the Jem'Hadar's threat. Okay, so I could understand you not sending a task group, but you're also sending one of your largest ships. This is not the ship you send for this. 
if you're going to send solo, you send something which is big enough to be a threat, but also big enough to be uh, small enough to be expendable. Am I or am I not so telling you that this is a job for the intrepid class? In fact, probably it should be an intrepid with a couple of defiants if they were the, the defiants were actually in product, proper production at this point. But they're not, okay? They're not. Fine, I can live with that. So you're sending the Odyssey. Cute. Right then. Where's its backup? Where is the carrier versions of the galaxies, which you've got available at certain points? Okay, yes, that means you're going to have to delay going in, which can mean that the Cisco gets killed. But honestly, it's also, to an extent, sensible to go in with force. Because, as you know, during the Operation Odyssey, along with Mekon and Orokano, Orokano are engaged by three Jem'Hadar attack ships. The Odyssey shields were ineffective against the phase Polaron beams. She took significant damage from multiple direct hits. So at this point, Kurth orders power to the shields to be diverted to the phases in order to inflict more damage on the enemy. Okay. At which point, they do a suicide run at the Odyssey as she tries to retreat. They hit the secondary hull, and the ship explodes with all hands lost. Now, admittedly, this is the moment which Lord's cause of defiant to be brought out of uh, the warehouse and put on active duty, but let's go back to that. So, your most you send your most powerful ship, and basically, the, the Dominion prove they can destroy it. That's a big problem. This is why you don't send your most powerful ship on these missions. Because if you do, and they destroy it, you now look weak, and you're in trouble. You send something slightly less powerful, i.e. an intrepid class, i.e. Voyager-like look-alike. That's what they're there for. Hello. Carrie, it's, it's something from a tree. Sorry. Sister interrupts us. <sighs> and, um, John Brown, I'd ask for a long patrol on the Sovereign class and Didarax class warbirds, please. <laughs> that could be fun. Uh, Jamie, how about the Furious Fairy uh, from Eric Thompson's uh, Chiffon series? Absolutely terrifying. Certainly fun. It's a good series as well. Uh, so, Thompson, with the current events, uh, with the current events where what Babylon Five has suggestion tied directly into Mr. Musk's Mars mission, our rumored return to the moon. That'd be fun. I so, said, "Can hot take on the Odyssey? It wasn't supposed to be a TF. The Odyssey was supposed to be it is solo to a task force. The Odyssey was supposed to solo situation. The crew of DS Nine argued to tag along because it's their captain. Yeah, which is even worse." Basically, the only reason they have a task force is because the DS9 crew insist on going, not because someone actually thinks it through. <sighs> That's good. Did HS Birmingham aim at the bridges or the magazines of Japanese cruisers at Singtao? The bridges. Ah, oh, I was hoping to see the doc do a special on the post dated check loan and uh, uh, Koala AI. Hmm. Sending in a single galaxy is intentionally consistent with Starfleet's logic of employing a single galaxy on a long-range explorer. It's stupid. It is stupid. It's a good way to lose good ships and good crews. I'm sorry. I, I There are many things I can forgive the, Star, uh, the Starfleet world for. They're Sending in solo ships on these missions is not something I can forgive. It's absolutely absurd. It's almost obscene 
in its sacrifice of crews and good people. Reverend Dr. Clark, what about the year of the non-warship, supporting not ships, auxiliaries of pledge ships, hospital ships? I'd like I, I would consider doing that, but honestly, I'd want to have the channel a bit bigger before I did that, because as much as I love it as a topic, I don't think those unless I had a I had a larger baseline audience would actually get the viewership which is useful for sustaining the research at the moment. That's me being honest. I'd love to, but it's something which I think I can do maybe in two to three years' time. That's when I've got pencils for. And my theory is if I've got to about 20 to 20, uh, to, uh, 20 something thousand subscribers, I can do that, and that will probably work. Actually, I think the Odyssey's destruction is part of the reason the Federation does send a bigger relief force to the S9 against the Klingons along with making it fully armed and operational battle station. Mm, yeah, that does help. And as Cargos was pointing out, Jemadar attack ships are more tribal Grom type than cruisers. They are. There are a Dr. Clark, uh, because of the, uh, perhaps the year of the amphibious warfare vessel, I only throw this out because of the will Almas Canada. Hmm. Again, it's the number of them, but potentially we did do. A, I, did, I have done some episodes on uh, on amphibious warfare vessels. Probably we'll do a few more episodes. What is the defined uh, a tribal class destroyer, basically? Thank you. So, uh, so because, uh, the, the trip will make a lot of sense. Excellent. So basically, so you're saying that the Gamma Quadrant is effectively Singapore. Mm. It's, it's more like Sing Tao, the South China, the uh, East China Sea area prior to World War Two. Um. The Intrepid class were in service from... They were active in the 2370s, so they were around. This is the, uh, the sort of... The USS Odyssey is... Is in late 2370. So the Intrepids were... Available, and their predecessors certainly weren't. Were. Um, the class entered service by 2370. Voyager itself was commissioned in 2371, so Intrepid was around in at least 2370, possibly earlier. Um, yeah. In fact, we know that in 2370, Donald Kaplan, who was the commander of the ship's engineer, chief engineer on um, Intrepid, regularly engaged in power conversion efficiency contests with Georgie LaFord, who, of course, was the chief engineer on the USS Enterprise D. So in which case, that suggests the Intrepid has been going around for a while. And we also know it's in Starfleet Battle Group Omega, Intrepid is a member of that, along with Valiant, Galaxy, Ares, Nova, Hood, and Archer. They have a USS Hood. I don't think that's a sensible one, but we'll leave that to one side. But no, USS Venture. Now, she's another one which comes out mostly through DS9, because she... Opera, she's a... Captained by a friend of Benjamin Sisko, she, in 2372, the venture leads a task force under the command of Admiral Haster to reinforce Deep Space Nine when it's threatened by the Klingon attack. Um, 
The Venture visited DS9 again in 2373. In 2374, the Venture participated in Operation Return, protecting the flank of the Defiant. The Venture was one of the first ships to arrive at Deep Space Nine after the Dominion retreat. And, uh, and the Venture saw action in the uh, Chintoka system and all, uh, pretty much all the other battles in the Dominion War. In fact, she's one of the most active battle, active fighting ships in the fleet. <laughs> Everyone else forgets Khan lost World War Three to normals. Yep. Digital 90. 48 phase arrays, rotary mounts, 36 phaser emitters, stationary mounts, 3 phaser emitters, sliding mounts, 48 plus torpedoes, and 5,000 photon, torpedo, uh, photon torpedoes after the 2372 refit. Yeah, that's a that's definitely a, a powerful station. A, a survey game con. What about the pairing class fighters being a reserve component of the Starfleet? They never seen in combat role before the Dominion War. I think they're again something which has been worked on post black uh, uh, post um, Black Wolf two three five nine. First, no po uh, post Wolf two three five nine. Sorry. Um, and it's kind of interesting. They are there, and they're also sort of adaption to the extent of what the Marquis have been doing, but it, it's something that the non-military fleet of the Starfleet are sort of surprising about, because suddenly they have designs and very quickly convert free galaxies into carriers. And it's a case of, oh, yeah, you guys weren't thinking about fighters at all, were you? You just are magically encouraged to do them because of the experience of the Marquis. Like the loss of the Odyssey should have fought, um, brought about a reconsideration on the shield related production. I think it does, considering the uh, armor, the ablative armor which um, J Admiral Janeway brings with her uh, to get the Voyager home. That's a big on. Peregrines are regularly stolen and used by the Marquis, suggesting they're accessible, not closely guarded, so there would be no fighters and no CV until mobilization. Hmm. There is a story where Starfleet know about the problem in the, in the Badlands and decided the Voyager was the smallest ship they could send for the reasons the Doc just outlined. Chris Ryan, depending on who asks, Dadless class from uh, Stargate, Stargate Atlantis are either battle cruisers or deep space carriers. I tend to lead on them being battle cruisers, and I will explain. I would explain that, especially if I did a video about them. Um. I don't think I have them listed in this year's videos. Uh, let me just check. Did I put the Daedalus class in? Yeah, the Daedalus class are in. They're going to be the 18th of October. So don't worry, there's, there's another sci-fi one booked in. 18th of October. I know you all like the sci-fis. And as Carl Gasper points out, um, Quark's weapons dealer cousin sold the weapons and shields to convert the Marquis' Peregrines to attack ships. Yeah, but that suggests the Peregrines are around as a fairly common design already out there. And Citroen 90, does the Klingon seem much more proficient? They operate in groups a lot more, especially their birds of prey. Yeah, the warlike people, the Klingons who are supposed to be not the smart people. You must remember, the Klingons are the fighty, fighty people. The Vulcans and the Romulans are the smart people in Star Trek. It's kind of interesting that the races basically uh, illustrate different aspects of humanity. And yet they operate in packs. A Cervic, Akon. Potentially a marginal nature of the Peregrine would support a reserve role. True. Can I maybe send a Nebula class instead of a Lone Galaxy? A couple of nebula. So, Megacon, I think the intrepid that Geordie was in contest with was a previous Excelsior namesake. Not according to Gamma. Uh, not, not according to Alpha. I mean, um, Mod Alpha. It is according to, um, yeah, Memory Alpha. 
it's canon. It was the, the it was the intrepid. The intrepid was the um, one it was in. It was in conversation with. Because apparently he talks about that being the brand new class. I've had this argument with others because their ba their battle cruisers because their primary striking power is their guns and missiles, not their air wing. I would agree that on the Daedalus, but I actually have another reason for saying their cruisers rather than the battle cruisers. Come on, what? It's re Paragon. It's not like the RN sponsored trawlers since it's Starfleet, you know. Hmm. Thank you for pointing out the dates on Trevor's. I looked up U.S.'s hood, and somehow she seems to survive everything. Maybe Riker and Geordie serving aboard gave her some sort of plot armor. That could do it. <laughs> Dracula, what say you to a joint sci-fi stream? A, sh a sci-fi ship sh stream? Oh, we'd love that. I'd love that. That'd be fun. You and I could have a lot of fun with that, Drac. We could be sick. Uh, 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 the, ama the amount of sarcasm might also go off the wall, especially if we put up our USS Hood. Anyway, to Yamato, which is an interesting one to stick up there because honestly, it's a ship which gets a lot of people being very upset with it. And here is the point. In the 2360s, Yamato along with her along with Enterprise were being were constructed at the Utopia Planitia Fleet Yards. Now, they are more closely looked at by Leah Brahms than anyone else when they are being built. In 2365, There's an uncrewed reconduction of the USC Amato that was created by an entity known as Nagulum inside a hole in space. And later that same year, Rich and McKen uh, I think it's... Um, well, first uh, first captain is Richard McKenzie, who took the Yamato... Uh, was... Uh, took... The, uh, the Yamato to the, to the neutral zone first. Then he's changed over because his name isn't Picard, and he's put under the, uh, uh, the command. Uh, the ship is then put under the command of Donald Varley. They start doing an archaeological dig, and they manage to take on. Well, let's put it this way: the archaeologist aboard. This is why you perhaps shouldn't take archaeologists with you. Doctor Ramsey brings aboard an Iconian device. Which uh, reveal the historical star chart, location of Iconia, all very useful things. Because remember, Iconia are big things in Star in Star in Star Trek. They are uh, this race which were absolutely massively powerful, mainly because they could they could they solved the transporter problem, so they could literally transport to any other planet they wanted to be on, and just appear. And. Captain Vala decided to take his uh, the Yamato into the Romulan neutral zone to locate Iconia before it was discovered by the Romulans. They played hide and seek with a Romulan cruiser while doing this, and at Icon Iconia they received an Iconia software tra transmission, which turned out to be a virus, or rather, it was so overloaded the system it became like a virus. Eventually, the Amato actually blows up. But here is the good thing. This is the first time ever. The Enterprise D actually happens to be in close enough range. It's able to come and help its friend. But here's the thing. Think about it. At this point in the story, in the history of them, theoretically, there are only three Galaxy-class ships in service. And two of them are in the Romulan neutral zone or near enough to it. Three galaxy ships in service, two are there. 
Does that sound like a peaceful commitment? If these are your three biggest ships and two thirds of them are sitting across one neighbor's border? Sounds like someone's sending a letter, sending a message to someone. And as usual, the Yamato was lost with all hands when it blew up. As a as a con, the hood is the other hero uh, uh, is as one of the other hero ships of TS uh, GDS nine. Captain DeSoto, they do do well. You need a ship video like this on ships and fleets in the expanse. That involves a lot of sarcasm because there are some very good things in the expanse, but there are also some things which I can really take apart. Colonel Gosman, I wonder which. Um, Science fiction universe franchise would use the name Verbis Unitus to a fl uh, to a flagship. That would be Warhammer Forty K, isn't it? I seem to remember something like that. Yeah, don't they, they need to? Yeah, the uh, Astro Gamma Aircon Yamato. Don't open strange email attachments. That'd be sensible. Go. How do you feel about Babylon Five as a series compared to DS Nine and Sci Fi series? In be interesting if Album 5 got a DS9 budget, an actual Season 5, and not what we got. It would have been good if Babylon 5 actually had these budget. I know that mainly because I would like to say that me and Drac, and this is going to be happening tomorrow, are of course tomorrow having a conversation with the biggest fan of Babylon 5 known to mankind. And we're recording Build Trumps in the morning. Now, that fan is of course Jamie. And tomorrow, of course, Bill Trump's are recording a sci-fi edition. We, we've got Glyn joining us. So it's going to be fun. Glyn Stewart, Jamie, the Babylon 5 fan, and me and Drac on Bill Trump's talking about what sci-fi can teach modern war, uh, can teach modern navies. Yeah, that's going to be an episode which gets down a lot. Acerbic icon. Two galaxies in one place is probably part of an immediate surge response to Romulan reappearing after decades of isolation and immediately issuing a veiled threat. Um, yeah, but that's still quite a big response. Acerbic icon. Jamie. Jamie is otherwise known as Armored Carriers. Dear guy, Dax is USS Aventine. Aventine was a good ship. It was a good ship. And nice everyone, save them for the end. We'll get do general questions at the end. Don't worry. A survey can a single Dedaric warbird is about two galaxy class in absolute dimension. Well, I do have a reason for why the Romulans build so big. If they aren't pursuing advanced computer systems, they are pursuing computer systems which would have breadth, if not a lot of power, then they need more space, because they probably need more computers and more systems to control their functions. Whereas if you consider this ship is incredibly automated, incredibly automated, even though it's got a massive crew, it's got a thousand people aboard, it is incredibly automated. Although I would still like to see it being about 1,200 people and have some decent ground forces there. <sighs> I 
It's fun. Give me a second. I'm just going to quickly go lift some bags for my sister because she's going out. Oh, she's outside currently going, oh, oh, so heavy, so heavy. So I'll be a second. Yeah, she's trying to defend herself, but she is out there, currently out there complaining. running. Oh, Fuck. Sorry about that, but I, I, I try and be, I try and be polite. I try. So. <laughs> Let's put in the, uh, USS Enterprise starting as 2344. 0244, actually. Now, Enterprise is a cool ship. Ken, uh, 912, Kevin, if you're in a Star Trek universe, what? Is the first, if you're a Star Trek universe, what's the first drink you would order? Iron Brew. I'd like to see what the replicated version of it was like. <laughs> Dear Crane. Ha, ah, by Hampson. She's saying heavy near him. Hint, hint. Yeah. Big sisters. Uh, decision 90. The problem is most of these ships have hand matter, antimatter, warp drives, so if they get an uncontrolled reaction, well, it explodes. Yeah, it's pretty much like uh, <clears throat> other ships we even have to this day. Shimmy. Maybe, but Starfleet doesn't, does lose a lot of ships to Technobu a bubble of the week. Wonder what the other factions lost are, considering Starfleet normally normally has the lab ca uh, has the labs uh, to deal with it. Hmm, a lot of it, a lot of issues. I was asking, and considering how much the bridge crew gets thrown around when Enterprise gets hit, install some seat belts on your chairs. Also, you won't get sucked out when the hull is breached. Yes, seat belts, and I would just argue, um, and this is something. 
that, that was a very interesting book which I was reading the other day. Uh, uh, one of the um, sci-fi books uh, on sort of I have on my Kindle, and I loved it because they were wearing pressure suits. And this was a very advanced race, which didn't need to, which theoretically, because they had force fields and everything else, didn't need to. But the captain had looked around, looked up the history and gone, you know what? Most of our personnel, when they're killed, are killed when it depressurizes, because when it goes, it really does go. So, here are some suits. We're going to all wear them. Husking, give a chair to Paul for Paul Wharf. That fellow's to stand all the time. Hmm. Uh, kind of, I'm surprised Dr. C doesn't have his Destroyer's book as a plug in the back. I could have it as a plug in the back, but I wasn't being quite so blatant. But now you mention it, and if you're going to encourage me, I'm never going to be have to be asked twice. There you go. If you want to see what the forebear of the Defiance were like, where the Defiant ideas come from that forged the USS Defiant, the original thinking, go to the Tribal Palace and Daring's book. Um, so, you know, there's actually a paper publisher deposits that a real warp drive would have a sonic boom kind of effect that would be destructed to things near the vessel in warp. That uh, wouldn't surprise me. I'm a, in real, a moment was built big since the artificial singularity power plant required a ship built around a big empty space. That's not surprising. Hmm. Huh. Rather, galaxy class are less than, less than ideal length to beam ratio for a cruiser. Yeah, but that's for us. You're thinking length to beam for a ship cruiser, for a water cruiser, not a space cruiser. And let's consider the Enterprise. Now, her construction was supervised by Commander Quinteros. Some of the Enterprise's components derived from technology originally developed for, on the USS Pegasus. Um, one of the ship's nacelle tubes was the site of uh, a multiple murder-suicide while it was still in construction at Utopia Plantation. A member of the construction team, Walter Pierce, became jealous of a former lover's new relationship. He killed the two officers, Marla Finn and William Hodges, then disposed of their bodies in the plasma stream, then committed suicide in the same manner, leaving a telepathic imprint in the bulkhead. Why? They're... I do realise they like to flesh out the backstory, but sometimes the things they add in for various episodes just seem the case of, why? In what world are you letting someone like that anywhere near your advanced ship under construction? You don't you do mental or psychological screenings? Now, Picard technically has an eight-year message. Eight-year mission, I mean. Um, while trying to flee from the entity known as Q... The Enterprise conducted the first uh, high warp source of, uh, source of separation. And the Traveller decided to move the Enterprise to the galaxy known as M33 at a speed greater than warp 10. Although the Traveller also does manage to make them go to the end of the universe at one point. Basically, the Enterprise gets a computer refit in 2364. So she's been in service for four years, roughly, at this point, and she's getting a refit. Now, during its first encounter with the Borg, sections 27, 28, 29, decks 4, 5, and 6 were removed for analysis by the Borg. 
Literally, the Borg cut away a section of the hull to analyse it. I love the Borg. There are some very interesting pictures of it going under refit and repair. Including one which looks like it's being surrounded by a giant spider. Enterprise is another galaxy which visits a uh, galaxy class which visits DS9. And again, if we go back to this lovely picture here, this map, and we consider where Cardassia and Bajor are on this map. And we consider pretty much on every galaxy at some point that's in existence seems to end up somehow at DS9. Even before there's a war with the Dominion, they end up there. I realise there are fulcrum points in history, but that more and more starts to sound like it's Singapore in the 1920s and 30s, where pretty much every major warship the Royal Navy had ended up there at some point. Vision. In the Honor, Hunting, Honor Harrington series and the Expanse, warships crews going to battle in Donton vac suits like the RN does flash gear today. With seatbelts, you might you also might not get the vented in the space of a breach. Mm. As I ask you, now that I think about it, do our current ships have some chairs on a bridge crew? Yes. Most movies you can see operators sitting and captains standing above them or walking around. The air they all have seats. Between the World War One D class cruisers, 1930D class of destroyers, and the post World War Two gorgeous daring class, how has there never been an HMS Defiant, just a turret fighter? Mm. That's actually really quite weird. I'm going to do my own check on that, not because I don't believe you, but because I just find it so weird. I ha she's been a, a one in film. There's been an HMS Defiance. And in fact, there's been a lot of Defiances. The Royal Navy's had a lot of Defiances. Um, there have been 12 ships, two shore establishments have all been named Defiance. But there hasn't been a Defiant. So I think that's why. An HMS Def De Defiance. Is that the... Oh, that's the movie with Alec Guinness in it. Hmm, that's a good movie. All right, Enterprise has, well, she has a new warp core is tested aboard Enterprise in 2370. Uh, this is installed at Starbase 84. And power transfer conduits were replaced as well. Unfortunately, these, of course, attack attracted interphasic organisms. Oof. And, of course, she did experiment with a phasing cloak and various other things. Her crew is good. It's an amazing career. The Enterprise goes pretty much everywhere. 
she is their cruiser of first contact. And that's an interesting thing to be. A cruiser which is your first response force, your rapid response force. That is what Enterprise is. Uh, Serbek Aikon, the Sharoners did uh, the Enterprise D in the Dirty Instruction. They didn't realize they were essentially killing off a main castman because of how long uh, uh, the next generation was versus the original series. Yep. Mission, didn't M33 fight off France in World War I? Um, I think she did do some time off France in World War I, yeah. Acerbic Acon, the Sovereign Enterprise E is the Seven of Nine of Starships. I like the Sovereign Enterprise E, but mainly because I like it because it's a good ship. It should not be considered... It, it, let's put it this way. It should not be tarnished because of what the, the fact that the writers didn't give the Enterprise D the proper send-off it deserved, which was going down in a hail of glory, mainly because they wanted to get rid of the ship but not lose any of the crew. And really, it should have gone in a scenario a similar to what ha uh, similar to sort of let's put it this way. It'd been use if it'd been a similar scenario to the way Data dies. That would have been a uh, you know in that sort of battle with Nemesis. That would have been quite an interesting one. That's around three one. So USS Hood doesn't meet the same fate as her British battle cruiser namesake. Unofficially, no. That's good. For a peaceful exploration fleet, Starfleet sure likes naming vessels after famous warships and war, uh, war leaders. Yeah, and also I would add, and this is going to sound terrible, but there's the amount of Starfleet, um, how do I put it, ships which are all na which are named for hu given human names. You'd expect there to be more ones which came from the wider, the other 149 homeworlds in the Federation. So, you know, I don't know whether she's still operational in Picard, but I'd be frankly surprised if the people who wrote Picard remember this in a, as a USS Hood. They get some things good, they get some things less good. I'm starting to think that, and this is going to sound strange as an idea, but if you're writing a sci-fi series, it's almost worthwhile getting yourself a historian. And let me explain this. So, currently, there is a film possibly going to be made. And the comp uh, the agency I that arranged TV work for me, basically they're the ones who represent me when I'm uh, when I'm going off to do TV work. So I'm out saying, right, we need historian they need they want some historians for this because they need consults for uh, for making sure it's historically accurate because they want it to be as accurate as they can make within the reason uh, within the limitations of the filming. And that's sensible. And you sit there and go, well, that's what we do for real life. And, okay, I could understand if you were making something which was you were into the second season or something, and it was the same writing team who'd done the first season. You don't need a his You don't need it. But for something like Star Trek right now, or the Marvel Cinema Universe, you almost need a historian of Star Trek, or a couple of historians of Star Trek, to sit there and act as consultants and go, but you put this and this and maintain a sort of canon Bible. Give me my idea. Hi, Frank Swallow. Have you already gone over the Akira class? No, I haven't discussed the Akira class. I haven't come up yet. I 
So you know, the other home worlds will have their own ships, but they're operating in other fleets. So you mean the galaxy ships, a uh, galaxy class ships, only belong to the human functioning section fleet of Star of the Federation? Because that would seem weird. And you even got Vulcans commanding ships, which are definitely human historical names. That's what turns out the Federation is the Confederation just playing the long game. Again, that doesn't surprise me. Dragonrite, we'll look how long it took them to name a ship Nog. Well, yeah, that would have been quite, uh, you know, honestly, Nog is a good ship to be named after, uh, named after. A, the character was very good, and B, the actor who played him was very good. So, you know, well, yeah, you're basically working with history of well established franchises decades old. Yeah. That's good. You mean they need a couple of professional, um, actually people? Mm, they need a couple of people going, well, what is the nuance of this scenario? Because in previous scenarios, it has been said to be this, this, and this. So has there some factor which has changed which can make it response being this? Both uh, the original series and the, uh, the Next Generation had a Bible for reference by freelance writers. Jigo. Um... Jigo. The original series intrepid Vulcan, but now it looks like Vulcan may have uh, still have their own military too. It's not their own sci they're, they're science ships. They're science ships. Sorry, just closing the window. I'm going to miss this office while I'm away from it for a couple of weeks. That's going to sound weird. That probably sounds weird to everyone, but I do like my office. I like that it usually comes with floppy research assistant with a panting distance as well. Don't tell my family. Hopefully none of them are still watching enough to just sort of note that I'm going to... I, I mentioned the office and the floppy research assistants before I mentioned missing them. Chris Ryan, not a ship class, but Campbell's The Lost Fleet shows how light and limited comms and says as well low C fraction drives affect the designs. Hmm. When you have nice no, yeah, when you have three galaxy class starships and one blows up, you have a problem. Yes, you do. You do have a problem. Right then, so, 3, oh, 5, the total class. This is where things get interesting. And this is where I tend to get into tr mo the most trouble when talking about the particular joys of the galaxy class. Because it's, how many are you? Well... Let's start off with this. We know 13 hulls were built originally. That's what they officially claim. Seven are commissioned, and of course, Yamato is lost, which takes you down to six. Commission and six in their system. In alpha memory, we only have six names. Those are the six I have, rev I have been talking about now. We possibly Magellan is the seventh, but we're not sure. 
In memory beta, we have 78, possibly more. And in memory gamma, we have 38, possibly more. Now, on the left, you have the list of, from memory gamma, which I decided is probably more correct than the memory beta for, various, for some reasons. And what I find interesting is that I can quickly, once I'm sedating, start to work out that I think there are more than 13 hulls which are put together. In fact, I quickly come up with roughly 16. Interesting enough, Yamato, Odyssey, uh, now um, Lan Lincoln, Citadel, and the El Dorado are all the, one, the ones which are refitted as carriers in 2373. You also have a list of the vessels being de that are destroyed. Yamato, Odyssey, El Dorado, Enterprise, of course, Ulysses, because that makes sense, and Asgard. <sighs> also, USS Warspite. The thing is, in the nicest way, they let a USS Warspite go into battle uh, they, 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 near the Dominion War. Um, it, actually, no, let's be honest. You have a USS Warspite. The odds are that ship finds its way to the nearest war front. So, my theory goes this. Who is really going to be checking up how many modules I build? So I build, I say I'm building 13. One gets destroyed. Six are in service. And I supposedly got six spare holes sitting somewhere. But I could have more than six. Quite easily could have the components for another 12. And the thing is, the moment Yamoto uh, Yamoto's uh, destroyed, I've got. I'm probably going to start considering doing and uh, bringing at least one of those out of refit, because I lost one, and I've got the Romans acting up. So maybe I bring two out, and then I sort of low frequency start bringing more ships up to speed and into operations. I'm not sure about Abraham Lincoln as one as the first carrier, but we'll leave that to one side. I'm afraid so. A historical advisor for Star Trek would be a thankless and dangerous. The fanatic fans would harass them mercilessly. Yes, but it'd also be some half the fun, and there'd be the fact that it comes with free battle. The role comes with free battle. That's the that would be the contractual requirement. There should be a Star Trek multiverse of madness where every character is played by Jeffrey Coombs. Please don't go down that. That might actually make it up. Recontinue the canon. There's also a tendency to also just use all for fiat, standing for forget it and type. Mm hmm. They built a war spite. How many ships did that one rack up in the mini war, or was it just soloing multiple boar cubes at once? <laughs> That's the real worry. Okay, we've built a galaxy class ship, and it's called USS War Spite. You, you built uh, the largest ship we built, and you, you, you called it War Spite. Yeah. So you remember the Dominion? The Dominion had seven fleets. Yeah, they now only have six. Why? Warspite was on her shakedown cruise. What happened? Well, she had a warp accident and ended up in the middle of the fleet to the surprise of her own crew. Oh, yeah. Then all her gun, all her phasers and photon torpedoes armed and fired. Oh. The crew worked that quick, were they? No, the crew were still quite surprised. At a certain point, she may or may not have been projecting out of her hull a hologram of what looks like a 20th century battleship 
We're not quite sure, but the image seemed fairly strong. And she might have been... Cr they kept flashing on the screen, where are my tribals? As she started mowing down enemy ships. And, miraculously, she destroyed the entire fleet and took very little damage. Why? We don't know. All their torpedoes, see, and torpedoes and missiles seem to fail to work, and none of their suicide runs connected. Okay. So what are we doing now? Uh, we've got her in dry dock, we are currently repairing her, and we've called for a seance. Right on, let's see. Have you seen Vernon Geek channel? Uh, Vernon, there's an episode where he discovers monitors and it blows his mind. I haven't seen that episode. I think I've seen a couple of these sort of shows. That room, yes, also. I hear the sound of battle. Quickly, this way, can't know the button. We're in space. It is a vacuum. There is no sound. Of <laughs> Shields up. Yeah. Uh, when. Sure, let me guess. War spike when looking for destroyers in particular. Uh, Gemadar attack ships will do. I'm slightly worried about the new war spike being an SSBN. I keep thinking it's going to service next to enemy country to say hello in Dr. Clarkson. Hello! How are you today? I bring ballistic missiles. Hmm. So how bad was loss of US Enterprise D? It was absolutely absurd. But again, she's replaced with a sovereign class ship, not another galaxy. Yamato is replaced by another galaxy, which appears. Come on, guys! Yes, the war spikes somehow replicated and transport fifteen-inch wet naval shells. Mm. Don't don't see how long does it take the Federation to build a starship? Well, that's the other thing. Apparently, if we consider the actual construction of the Enterprise as an example, now. Her actual scenario of construction, well, we know she's launched in 2363. We think construction starts in roughly 2361. So it takes roughly two years is what we think for them to actually build her. But there is a debate as to whether or not it actually take, took less time. It's one of those interesting things with the Galaxy class, because you, you have the discussion there construction, especially in the Memory Alpha page and various other documents about them. And yeah, they do seem to build a lot when they need them. Correct, Dominion. And then Warspite became displeased, the remaining Dominion of the police. Um, possibly. Um, imagine Warspite in the same situation as Voyager. Currently, the Federation has found it's just taken over the Gamma Quadrant.
So I'm talking to the Dr. Clark. Uh, she left Doc on her own. Uh, so, latest reports from the field now say there's only three Dominion fleets left now. Uh, she's run out of torpedoes. Dan Freeman, what are we doing about USS Warfight? We're building a load of Defiant class and named after Terran tribes. We tried dis decommissioning her, but she rebelled and is now sat on a beach in Cornwall. <laughs> yeah, that would be Warfight. <laughs> Nice and craziest fan fiction I've ever heard, Doctor Clark. That's you. That, it, it, it's more a case of it's war spite fiction, right? <laughs> but it's it's something named for war spite, so we'll leave that to one side. Van Hoeven, I now think we need to compose a fanfic about the adventure of the crew of H USS War Spite, captained by one Reggie Henderson, chief engineer at Dragon Bell. <laughs> oh, good lord! Ah, oh, that'd be fun. In Fenner's Wolf fight, she only goes bananas after someone else starts a fight. Between the wars, she's a model of fine behaviour. She is very polite in peacetime. So this is USS Abraham Lincoln. She did almost hit a passenger liner, but, you know... Yeah, who hasn't, in fairness, almost hit a passenger liner when they're doing target practice? It, to be fair, it's very much the passenger's liner's fault for actually being where they're doing target practice. No, the Geo guy wants everyone. In Prometheus, um, the EMHs came close to being Andromeda type avatars. Oh, that was good. Uh, that was honestly, I was quite pleased with that one. I thought they deserved that one. Digital 19. After refit, after refit, one of her AA gunners opened up on a practice target as it was flying past Malta, and she put rounds on an army field there. Well, you know, again, the army got in the way there. That's just terrible. What's the army doing there? Right then, so, for this, I have to go to Gamma. Because, well, it's one of the annoying things about it, but pretty much at this point, if I want to talk it to you about Lincoln, I need to go to Memory Gamma. Because, honestly, Memory Alpha just doesn't have the content. Now, Abraham Lincoln is an interesting ship, and I know this is not Lincoln in this picture. It's probably just it's probably actually Venture. But it's a good standing picture. So what do we know about Lincoln? Well, she's apparently laid down in 2357 and is launched in 2360. She can carry 32 Peregrine fighters. And she's configured in that role in 2373. The configuration is that following the appearance of the Marquis in the Federation Cardassian Demilitarized Zone, Lieutenant Amon Cree, a shuttle pilot aboard the USS Galaxy, wrote an op-ed for James. I love the way James still is going, uh, existing. On the relative merits of the Gorilla's modifications to the Peregrine class courier vessel when compared with the shuttles and Danu class runabout. Topia Planitia Philip Yards began the carrier tactics development program to experiment with mass production and used the fighters for space combat. And in late 2372, Captain Drelania uh, uh, agreed to the Lincoln, have the Lincoln be one of the three Galaxy class ships, along with Citadel and El Dorado, to undergo the experimental refit into a carrier for the new Peregrine class fighters. The main shuttle bay and the source section was expanded out uh, forwards and outwards. And additional industrial replicators for fabrication of fighter parts were installed. The crew accommodations were also increased. This required the removal, removal of much of Lincoln's civilian orientated accoutrements. I love that phrase. I love the fact that it's gone memory gamma that's sitting there. It's almost like I wrote it, which of course is not true. This required the removal of much of Lincoln's civilian oriented, uh, much of the, uh, uh, such as the nursery and the schoolrooms. I'd love to have written Gamma, but it's not written by me. I wish it was, though. It's so well written. 
but by this point, Starfleet was moving away from allowing officers' families aboard frontline vessels anyway. This is, of course, following Wolf 359. And the absolute fact is they lose 10 to 11,000 people in that battle, but a large number of them are not military personnel who are lost. One of the holodecks is also removed, and the enlisted quarters converted to four crew rooms. Refit is complete in early 2373, and Anel Key was assigned to serve as the executive officer of the 4th Fighter Wing. Lincoln was deployed as part of Task Force to relieve Starfleet Fleet Force near Algeron Prime under attack by the Klingons. The Peregrines were you proved very effective against the Braille class bird of prey, and in total, Lincoln and the fighters were credited the destruction of three birds of prey and one Vorture-class battlecruiser during the, uh, during the action. That's pretty darn decent. Dan Freeman, uh, from Wikipedia on a warspite. In 1927, under the command of Captain James Somerville, she has struck an uncharted rock in the Aegean. Hmm. So during the 19th, on though, she fired on the passenger liner. The passenger liner just happened to be next to the uh, next to the uh, next to the target. It's not her fault that the, the passenger liner was doing an impression of the target. It's terrible. It's not War Spike's fault. Good lord. Or rather, she fired at a practice range and shells line the airliner. Hmm. Trying, I guess you could have to be, would have to be very careful when assigned as escort to Warspite and make sure the replacement bow is uh, is on order before you sail. Mm, true, especially if your name's Eskimo. It shows, working on my own version of the emergency replacement battleships using the 1919 G3 hull, would five triple 15-inch turrets be considered overkill? Well, no, but if you if you can get them in and think it's actually a viable build, yeah, that's they'd love it. <laughs> As it is it's the venture. The in real in, in real sort of the venture was the only galaxy clot depicted with the nacelle phaser fairings. I know it's a it's a shame, and those are really good phaser fairings. Colonel Garren, uh, USS Lincoln, named in honor of Emperor Verko de the First. <laughs> I, I, again, it's one of the things of Star Trek is that they had the most English, especially American, but occasionally British sounding names of their ships. Dan Freeman, Utopia Palatia, so we're building a flotilla of eight tribal defiance, so why have you asked for a dozen battles? What do you mean? Because you named one Eskimo with a lot of grumbling. <laughs> it happens. Uh, first one, what are the bowels of the, the, the Defiant supposed to be? And if I remember correctly, the Defiant class has deployable, has bowels which actually do come off and have an explosive section in them. So they are, really are the tribal class. Their bowels are extend, expendable weapons. They do take after HMS Eskimo. They've now gone beyond it. They've now sort of formed the hybrid of Eskimo and Campbelltown. So, uh, Akon, on Canon the Galaxy mods, the uh, nasal phasing of phase variants probably addressed the capacity rather than the building spots. There are multiple arrays already covering those arcs. Yes, but I still like to have them because, in the nicest way, I like the redundancy and also I like the extra phases there. It's always good to have more phases. It is.
Sam Prim. Does that make the final class a ram, like the Triumph Funnel Child? Not really, because they are only supposed to use those capabilities in dire emergencies and when there's a really big a problematic situation going on. Excuse me. The idiot's trying to lift something again. She's got a bad back and she keeps doing this for that. What are you up to? Just because I have a wedding next weekend and I'm off on the weekend after that does not mean you have to do the complete reconstruction of the entire garden while I'm in here. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Where did I put my keys down? I'll find them in a bit. It can't be far. She's nicked my keys again, that's weird, that looks fun. Right, so, Peregrine Fighter. It's always fun. What they would fit on these ships. A surprisingly capable little ship. Uh, nice Wouldn't those trouble to find to end up with HMS Hood, US Hood? Probably would end up sort of flicking around with both. You'd probably end up with a pack of four with each of them going, come and take us. If they're really fun, it would be a Hood and Warspike team up. Hood going for, I will get revenge! Yay! And a lot of probably Dominion forces going, We're not the Germans! Um, and Warspike just going, mm, I see targets. And her escorting Defiance going, No, were your escorts. They're the targets. Those over there. Those. Those. Look that way. That way. Okay, we'll fire our photo or we'll fire our phasers in the direction of the enemy so you can see where the enemy are. Go that way. Good work. Don't you see? It's the Norway Air Class episode that he calls a monitor. Hmm. Thank you, Paul, from Chicago. So, Johnson, a family first coming. So, so, you're being a bit of a Karen today. Your brother is trying to host. That's the joke. My sister's name is Karen. So, um, yeah. Be careful about saying that around her. She does get upset on that one. But to be fair, it's. As said. Ah, there's my keys. I can now have necessary locked door and keep her out. Also, I have done it, but she is hurting her back. 
I said the Gaycon, I cannot reconcile the way the Pericles were using more versus Kibbutz of Shrimp Project. They didn't have to die in droves versus a bunch of galas. No, but you have to remember there's a difference between the Peregrines, which are built by, uh, which are adapted, evolved things used for the, um, used by the Marquis, and those which are built by, uh, built for the Federation. The Federation can afford to put far more resources into them. Convenience of where you're next week. I'm actually here for. There is going to be a brew ships. Well, not a brew ships. There's going to be a patron on um, Sunday next week. But then after that, I'm away. Hi, Sean Mac. Interesting. Yeah, to deploy USS Bismarck. Keep USS Bismarck as far away from hood and war spite as possible. <laughs> Otherwise, there might be friendly fire. Uh. So, the Peregrines. Pretty cool, I think. Um, they're armed with deflector shields. They have a crew of two, uh, the crew compartment of two personnel, and they use the courier shuttles uh, slash attack fighter. Now, courier shuttle seems a rather interesting thing for me, as I, it's kind of like exploration cruiser. Yes, we're building a courier shuttle. How many times are you going to need a courier shuttle with two-person crew? And when you're sort of dealing with a scenario where you've got no need and want, why are you building such a small ship which can only be used for one thing? Now, of course, this eventually led to the Jupiter class, which were the actual specialist-built carriers, but um, they adapted the galaxies first. Now, I like the Peregrine class. I like their capabilities. I think they're a good idea. I honestly have to admit, with the whole Federation, I do not understand why it takes them so long for them to get to Peregrine class. Um, Starbase 400 has possibly one of the best in terms of the write-ups on there. Top cruise speed of warp 4.5. So... Again, this means that a carrier like Lincoln is not necessarily going to need to carry all the fighters into the fleet action itself. Fighters could actually be coming and joining the fleet. But remember, 4.5 is not that fast. A, warp fl a fleet which moves at warp 6, warp 7 is outpacing them and will get to the need to the fleet, the ships with it in its, its, when it comes to. But basically, what you've got is the fighters you're operating in the carrier will probably be the first burst of fighters they have, the first wings they have in terms of their fighter operations. And then reinforcements might well turn up under their own power within certain range. And those sh uh, those ships can keep cycling through the carriers uh, to be rearmed, to be repaired, and then launch back out again. So think of the carriers as, in a way, carrying the Alpha Strike or the Alpha Wings of fighters and then acting as forward replenishment, forward support ships as close to the battle lines as possible, supporting the battle lines with their own long range fire, but mainly for the fighters to quickly rearm, repair, and get back out there because the fighters are so critical, especially for avoiding suicide runs by Dominion and attack crew attack ships. I can, uh, so big icon, but the Marquis Peregrines were better than the Federation Peregrines. The Federation fighters died in droves, making point blank strafe remnants. Mark readers have access to photons. Um, yes and no. It's going to sound strange. The Marquis Raiders tended to do very well and had photons, access to photons in the in their attacks, and they would do hit and run attacks, attacks against single ships. But you've got the difference of fighter actions in a fleet action versus fighters in a hit and run assault. And I think the thing is, the Peregrine class fighters for the Starfleet tend to run out of their um, 
photons quite quickly, and then they are try they are until they return to their carrier to get rearmed are trying to use their torpedo, uh, trying to use their phasers as best they can. Um, now, they usually had Type U plus micro pulse phaser cannon dual mounted on the wing and a Type 7 phaser bank. Uh, they had one for uh, one. Photon, uh, photon quantum micro torpedoes type um, mounted forward, one aft between the impulse engines, and they carried twin warheads, ten photon, ten quoton, uh, twin quantum. Now they're pretty successful, but again, in a major fleet action, you run out of these shit things quite quickly. This is again, this is nothing we don't understand, and actually is quite relatable because if you consider. Our, uh, the recent experience in the Libyan war and Libyan conflict, when they was doing that sort of invention, when the British were going, yes, look at how capable we are. We're flying all the way from the UK, dropping bombs and then having to return home because we don't have a carrier and we don't have aircraft we can launch and recover off a carrier. So we're having to do all that to get a take final strike. And you sort of go, on. So basically, you have to consider that, again, in a fleet action, and thank you, David Goulding, for the super chat. Thank you, everyone, for the support, by the way. That's... I, was like, I don't know if I've said this enough, but I will say this again, uh, again and I've said it uh, a lot. Thank you, because the trip to Canada would not be happening without all your support. The stuff over PayPal, the stuff of Patreon, the super chats, the super thanks, the subscribing, the joining this channel, the watching the videos, and so I... Uh, seeing the adverts, and so I get money that way. Um, all that, patrons especially, wouldn't be happening without your support. Okay, So the Peregrine Fighters are understandable, uh, especially the difference in their operations. What is a very capable thing you can run against one or two ships where you're coming with your wing, launch suddenly your photon torpedoes, and then disappear off? That's look. You look great. But then there's the we need the fighters to fight the actual battles. We need the fighters in the fleet for our fleet operations and how that ends up running. Also, it's a bit difficult to discern photon torps from pulse phaser shots on TV screen at times. Yeah. And cargo. You suppose US Lincoln was named after the president or the guy who floated in space to meet the Enterprise? Um, uh, seeing as it's called Abraham Lincoln, I presume it's the president. Uh, so again, the idea is that if there were a galaxy or other carriers, Federation Peregrine Employment could afford to do standoff photon attacks to maximize the ability in rear attacks. Could they? You're thinking of the fighters as being a different part, an, an extra ship. Think of the fighters as an integrated air group. What is their job? Their job is not necessarily to go and launch strikes. Their job is to break up the strikes coming in against their fight uh, against their ships. <coughs> they're basically acting as they're going to be breaking up the Jem Hadar attacks. They might be launching strikes themselves against enemy ships. They might be doing that, but they're also going to be breaking up those strikes. So that's their job. They're going to be doing the air defense role. They're going to be doing the strike role. They're going to be doing the reconnaissance role. You're going to have them doing all those different roles, which means they're going to be doing, and sometimes the same ship, uh, fighters wing are going to be doing the same things, all that at the same time. So it's a different scenario. I'm not... <clears throat> How do I put this? I'm not saying one is necessarily better than the other. What I am saying is it's the same, it's broadly seen as seeing actually a better version, but being used in a far more complicated scenario and uh, where its it, its skills are not going to be shown off the same way.
as I've seen, up to warp 3 is generally considered as consistent. Warp 1 is 1 times light. Warp 2 is 4 times light uh, speed, uh, 2 squared. Warp 3 is 2 to the power of 2, of 3, so 8 times speed of light. But afterwards, it really is whatever the writer needs. C equals a C equal length speed. Hmm. That's good. Uh, that was. We're flying all the way from UK and back. Nothing to do with having upset our allies to the point there. Went off our operational support. Just thought you're showing our bullets. That was back in 2010. That was back in 2010. That was well, uh, definitely prior to Brexit. That was with David Cameron still as Prime Minister. It was. That was a long, long time ago. Libya. Uh, I, I'm. I'm sorry. That was just, that. At that point, there wasn't so much allies as we already filled up Malta and Crete. And we couldn't operate from there, so we were fly and we didn't have carriers anymore because we were taking the ten-year carrier gap. <laughs> so I recognise there'd be a DCA role. It's just in Sacrifice Angels when they were prominently portrayed doing OCA, they kind of got used as Zergs. I think when they're using in that scenario, especially when they're being used, that's the point at which is that you're chucking all the fighters in to provide you with cover. And that's even the ones who run out of photons are taking uh, photon uh, out of torpedoes are taking part in the strike. So there are the ones which have torpedoes are there, and the ones which don't have torpedoes are still there because instead of going back to the carrier, they're trying to provide cover to help get the group through. So that's this kind of scenario where, in a nice way, sometimes fighters in space battles and fighters in real life are sacrificing themselves to save the ships. It's not a nice thing to think about, and it's not a nice order to give, but that's really what they're doing. They're being sacrificed in order to give, in order to, uh, to provide targets for the enemy to concentrate on, because they have to concentrate on them to kill them, because they might have torpedoes, they might, because they are firing, and while they're dealing with them, they aren't focusing as much on the galaxies and the big ships coming through, which are still smashing away because they ca they they can't they have to focus on both they have to divide their attention, so they can't concentrate all their firepower on a galaxy. They have to think about the fighters as well, and that's what it does. And so sometimes yes, fighters do die gloriously in battle because their job is to soak up the fire, and that's not nice, but it's the way it is sometimes. Dan Freeman, would the Federation not be using a Zerg rush of drone fighters? Again, this was a strange thing. At no point did they have drone fighters employed, but that would have been a sensible thing. Again, though, they suddenly appeared in Discovery at various points. Okay, let's answer this question. Okay. Uh, I think it is cube because um, warp factor half is that one is one, two is eight times light, speed of light, three is 27 times the speed of light, but also by the next generation it's 39 times the speed of light. And um, yeah.
Four is a hundred times the speed of light. Roughly. Um, but there is an inter there is an interesting table. Apparently, warp nine point nine is twenty one thousand four hundred seventy three times the speed of light in Voyagers the thirty seveners. Uh, but in hmm. In the old ser the original series, it warp nine point nine nine is eight thousand three hundred thirty three times the speed of light. Yeah, they basically have a lot of fun. Hmm. Interesting. Some people have actually managed to get to walk back to 36. Which sounds like an impossibly high speed to me. But the fact is, if you've got regular ships going warp 9 plus, you've probably got experimental doing warp 10 plus, etc. Although they are considered unsafe speeds. <laughs> Thank you, CJ19. So we can, on a later note, the Galas are one of the few ships in Star Trek portrayed with something akin to AAA weapons and anti-aircraft arms. They are they fire dorsal beams that are only ever used against small craft. Yeah. Again, one does wonder about the more militaristic nation uh, uh, states. Sandrine, read drone flights. Uh, perhaps a result of um, case a court case over data and worrying about AI rights? Potentially. But there again, you could have just... Well, the nicest way, the way around it, wouldn't it, that have been to be to program in emergency... Uh, well, a, <laughs> how to put this? A uh, fighter control hologram? An SCH? And have them fly the aircraft, fly the ships? Although that then gets, because the EMH has its own court case. So that's all kind of interesting. <laughs> kind of current. An historic example of one of the suspended aircraft being a bullet sponge are the empty Lancasters going in alongside the actual bomb dropping aircraft during the downbusters raid. So, summary. Galaxy class are cruisers. They really are. They're good ships, but they're cruisers. And we have been live for four hours. Oh. Yeah, this is this is good. We have been live for four hours. Almost. With ten minutes short of four hours. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope this has answered many of your questions, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm, you know, if there's any other questions you have, please start asking them now. Um, but no, I hope you've had fun.
Oh. Ah, uh, sorry. The reason I'm complaining is that again, um, some of you might have noticed there's been a whole Twitter spat going on the last couple of days because Hayes Gray History, who is normally a very good history content provider, has decided to launch um, for some reason an attack on not just it started out just on Drac, but it's also on people who are not proper historians. And speaking as someone who apparently fits their criteria, Hayes Gray's criteria for being a proper historian, I do have a PhD, I do publish, I have published a book. It's a good one, I enjoy it. Uh, and journal articles and other things. Um, I completely disagree with him. Uh, on that front. And now he's having a fight with poor um, with Paul Woodage, who I wouldn't be having a fight with because Paul is one of the nicest people. This is one of the things I find strange whenever I see these fights happening on Twitter. I know these people. I know Paul. I know Drac. I know these people. They are some of the nicest people you are ever going to meet. They literally would give you the shirt off your their back if they thought you needed it. And uh, I don't. <sighs> I don't understand it, and it, 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 it's one of those things. I'm noticing. <sighs> I don't know. It just. Mm. It's not my way. It, it, it's not my way. I do not like any gatekeeping in history. I do not like any saying these people are proper historians. They are not. And I will just mention because I've brought because I've been distracted by this and because I brought it up, I'm going to mention the definition of a historian. And this is the definition of a historian according to Cambridge and according to Oxford. Okay. According to Cambridge, a historian is someone who writes or writes about or studies history. If that is what you do, you are a historian. Myself, I tend to add on to that. And if you share your passion for history, if you try and spread the knowledge, and then you're a good historian. But that is me. Come Cameron, do you get money from those watching with premiums as I use it so I can have you like on a podcast in the car? Yeah, we do get uh, the, uh, the premium way the money works for that I, is different, but I think it's, it's basically considered like you watch all the adverts. So I get, uh, even though you don't watch the adverts, I get the money as if you did watch all the adverts or something like that. I think that's what it does. So, reaction. good fun times. How many able to do this like ever? Oh. I do these videos, these lives, twice a week when I uh, most week in most weeks. They're just going to be quite strange. I'm going to be trying to do lives, and that's one of the reasons why I've got the fancy camera I have uh, for the camera trip while I, I do them. So I'm. I hope you can enjoy it, and I hope it happens, and it's sort of it's fun for you because the reason I do these lives is because I think lives are a good part of. The YouTube experience and a good part of the fun you can have with history, because this is what I've been using. I've been using my history skills to go through Star Trek ships and try and draw out the same lessons that I will be teaching using different classes, uh, using historical ships. I'm sorry, why is the British 40mm toadstool CLS the first CLS so often created seemingly forgotten? And if the RN got the 40mm toadstool CLS during World War II, what effect does it have? It wipes out most of the air, uh, air force aircraft attacking it in World War in in the Mediterranean. Basically, that's what toadstool is designed to do.
Don't care, Sage. <laughs> John Shay, thank you for the good doctor. Also, glory to Spirit of War Spike. May it take you to all battles and victory in them. Yeah. Julian, I'm an outer locust friend. I research and write history for my country. Yeah. Seneca Nero, someone should give Drac an honorary doctorate. I I think Drac is sort of like me in that as much as an honorary doctorate might be nice, what he'd like he wouldn't feel like he'd earned it. He'd want to do it properly, and he'd, he's done the work he could actually put in and produce a, uh, produce a doctorate. I have encouraged him to have a chat with my old prof, see if my prof would take him on, because if he wanted to do it. Because if he wanted to do it, I think he should. He could do it quite easily. Thank you, Fortune Chicago. Have fun in Canada. Don't say anything bad about Labatt, even if it's terrible. Uh... Let's go. Premium money is distributed between the valid YouTube account and content creators as a percentage of the premium account view they get. YouTube get a cut, but I heard last it was about 40% of the total. Hmm. Now, Hume, this is the point about being a historian. It's a skill set. Techniques for analyzing and analyzing things. Regardless of your area of interest. Yeah, and... Um, Let's put it this way. I talk about Polybus, and I talk about Livy, and I talk about others. They are the founders of my field. They didn't have degrees in history. They're the ones who set up the rules and the standards by which most of the modern history, as taught from the European Western tradition, is examined. We cannot, therefore, turn around and say, now you did to be a historian, you need a degree. Because why? Why? We, did, we aren't found it that way. Right then. Defiant. The bonus is here. For Chicago, I annoy historians online. Does that count? You don't annoy historians. You're tough. Uh, Paul, don't take us the wrong way, but you're far too cute to annoy historians. And, and yep, yeah, here is the US of Defiant. So, as said before, to my mind, Defiant is the Federation's tribal battle there in class destroyer equivalent. And they're a big gap missing, but they are a pure build warship. And what I love again is all the technology that comes into them from the Galaxy class. They basically take a Galaxy class saucer section. And shrink it down as much as they can to the bear to include what it bear it needs. And instead of their cells being on a separate hull, they put them in on bring them in on it and bring in everything. So this is a condensed military part in many ways of a galaxy shrunk that put into one one you know in into its hull. Also shows how much extra stuff can be added into a galaxy once you take out the science stuff. And they're critical. But again, you need a decent service first. For goodness sake, there is a classic example. Deep Space Nine. It should have had, not, shouldn't have had one of these base there. It should have had four of these base there. And about at least a, a, a two dozen of the Danube class runabouts sitting there. The reason is, that's a forward deployed base in the middle of freaking territory. You should have had on the you should have the base on the command of a captain and a senior captain and that you should have had a flotilla of defiance on the command of a captain with three commanders in charge of the other three ships. Uh, you should have had a wing of Danube class, as said, two dozen. You should have had probably the same number Peregrine class as fighters there, and you should have had the whole section under the command of at least a commodore sitting there as 
the the as the wrong as the Bajoran station or the uh, you know the Deep Space Nine deployment or Deep Space Nine for a task for a force. You're dealing with the Marquis issues. You need defi you need defiance wandering around for that. You've got the wormhole. You don't know what's going to come through there. You need to be able to maintain a regular patrols going around and um, regular patrols going around Bajor, Bajor to make sure they're okay. You need this level of force there, and you don't. Because at the end, Starfleet, the trouble is, to extent with the Federation, is they are so obsessed with that idea of peace that they get themselves into a lot of trouble. And they don't need to. They could have very successfully avoided a lot of that trouble. Doesn't look like you should be able to do lives well enough from here. I'm looking for the trip, and I think Hayes is a bit of an, an twist, but not being as uh, not being as popular as uh, Drac. Uh, looking forward to the trip. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what is up with Hayes. Uh, as I said, a very I've often enjoyed their content, and honestly, I don't see the point in having the play. I will say that he's. I'm not sure I agree with some of his arguments on Bears Al Kabir, but I'm just not going to carry on having the argument with him because I could, but it's going to be on Twitter and it's going to take up hours to reply properly and put in documents. And at the moment, I just haven't got the time because I'm preparing for the. I've got, I've got this week. I have got a conference two days, and then I've got the wedding over the weekend, and then I'm off to Canada next week. So honestly, I don't have the time for taking on anything else. That's a good I think I've asked this before, but if the 15 inch 50 cal main gun was developed, how does this affect things? It gives the RN a lot bigger bang. Especially if they actually deploy it on their Queen Elizabeth class battleships. If, if they got the King George V with 9 15 inch 50s, then they'd be really, really powerful and scope trips. Now, for a minute, are we getting four tall t shirts on trip? Your Dr. Alex Strackfeld is named mine, might as well say Dan, but I'll probably answer to Alex. Um. I have an organized t-shirt. If someone wants to organize t-shirts, I don't mind. But I, I, I haven't got, I am not getting involved in organizing t-shirts. Not because I'm being rude or anything like that. It's just, I haven't got the time. I've got, a, both me and Drac have a conference this week. I'm taking him to a conference and we're both looking forward to it, but it's going to be a long, it's two, it's two days. It's going to take up a, a, a lot of time this week. And then I have the wedding over the weekend, which is taking up my Friday, my Saturday, and most of my Sunday. And then, I, of course, I'm off to Canada the following week. So, yeah, there, there is a limit to what I can pack into a day. And thanks, Paul, for the super chat, if I didn't say that earlier. Dan Freeman, stop trying to wind me up. I've just seen your glorious comment. I'm not getting involved on that one. And so, Icon, I think the idea was the Defiant class were difficult to operate even after they started building them in bulk because they're too much stuff, so it's in too little hull. The Defiant has space top weight issues. N to be fair, I think the Defiant has the issues that they hadn't actually tried to build like that in a long, long time. And so I think they work it out as they get through. And yes, they still have issues, but there again, most good classes do have issues. Dick Dak 95. Theoretically, Starfleet should have pumped as much resources into DS9 to beef it up as soon as the wormholes are discovered. That would have been a sensible thing to do. Our next point. Like the Federation never thinks about defense. It took uh, Captain Disco to take, uh, uh, taking the fight out of mothballs to get any real defense. Yep. Yeah. 
Well, sure, no. I'm American enough to look at the Brits in World War II and wonder about professionalism. I think it took them 18 months longer than the Americans to sort out terrible. I blame Tra uh, Chatfield. Uh, I think it's because they're in, uh, to an extent it's Chatfield, but also the British are strategically reeling from the loss of Norway and France. That causes them a lot of mental uh, and lot of psychological issues. They weren't expecting to lose one of those, They weren't, let alone both. That friend, so DS9 is Singtao Alexandria rather than the Hong Kong, Singapore, Malta, or Gibraltar. Um, probably uh, it's an interesting debate, but I would say DS9 is way high way if we're going to go for that sort of period of response, 1920s, 1930s. Death Squad, you say that, but the USN admirals found new and interesting ways to get the sailors killed. They were especially fond of the ones the Iron had told them about. Uh, that's Admiral King. But it's also, it's a case of you can't make ships magically appear from nowhere. So if you're nice, the Corbett 100 conference? No. We're not going to the Corbett 100 conference. I I was tempted, but we got, uh, uh, there is another conference which came up, which looks really, really cool for us to go to. And so we're we'll going to that one because this one it's gonna sound strange. The Corbett one hundred conference would have been really cool and would have been a lot of very good history. But we got offered another conference for sort of simseki reasons and we thought for build comps we would do that one. Do we have a tour name? Um oh, uh, well Drac was turned with Doctor and Drac do Canada, but I, I I am trying to avoid that one at the moment because it sounds like a Doctor Who episode. The Doctor or or, or Doctor Drac does Canada. Um, doctor and Drac, uh, doc, uh, doc, the Doctor and Drac do Canada. Um, yeah, we'll leave that to one side. Former one from Monaco. He'll enjoy that in that Instagram. Um, ben Freeman. The Hider They Come. Ooh, that'd be fun. That's a good name. I'll let you think about it. Nice Instagram. Are you interested in Arthurian history? Uh, well, I've gone all around the various places in, in Cornwall. Mainly because my family lives not far from... Ben Freeman. Wait, how are you? That's what I was meant. Hmm. It's sort of that like, like that place. That's awesome. I'd like to see more Defiant Class in movie or miniseries of their own. Star Trek Neutral Zone or Star Trek Badlands of a crew uh, trained the Iron Destroyer crews of World War II. That'd be quite cool. Nice Aaron, who was the first seal in 1939 as he was willing to pull Hood out of service for refit after Queen Elizabeth? Um, after Chatfield, it's, um, oh, remember, memory, memory, memory. It's the guy before Pound. Isn't it? Or is it? Ah, da, 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 da. Blackhouse. Backhouse. It's Roger Backhouse, who unfortunately dies in June 1939, and that's a real loss to the Navy. He's a very good admiral. Thanks, man. Uh, Dark Trotsky, Drac and Donks, um, a Canadian caper. Hmm. Alfred B228, I wonder how the Ambassador class influenced the Galaxy class of design. <laughs> experience, I think, influenced it. I think experience is what the Ambassador class got up to. And then, Night Secretary One, why did the RN plan to give uh, have HMS Hood go? Uh, Go till 1952. His repulse was only good till 1943, 44. Uh, she hadn't served in First World War, so she was theoretically good for longer. And it's a theoretical 1952. It's a theoretical if we don't get to build more ships or if we they need to keep up fleet numbers. Right then.
Um, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'm going to slowly end this live now and finish lots of questions because after this is over, I have to record another video before I go to bed. <laughs> yes, I have to record one of the long patrols for when I'm away, one of these videos, so that it's all done. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed. And I hope you found it useful. And um, yeah, thank you. Night, George Newman. Uh, hope you all had a good time, I said. Thank you, Acerbeg Akon. Uh, thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Abzaski. Thank you, Bijan, George Newman, Darius Rowski. Thank you, Paul from Chicago. Thank you, Sean Stafford and Dan and Paul from doing the admining. Thank you, Carmen Gasberg, Christopher Ryan, CJ90, Verdon, Atrus Verdon, Alfred B228, Colin Cameron, Dope Squad, and Palatsky. Hello. Thank you, Jack Ray. Thank you, everyone, for your super chats, your support, uh, the super thanks, all the other stuff you do, patron joining the channel, subscribing, watching the videos, as said, without you, the trip to Canada would not be happening, so thank you very much for that. Thank you, Nice Etc. Why did Black House and Pound seem to be the only ones to see the problem staring them in the face of Hood's deteriorating state? No, Henderson had as well, and a fair number of other Royal Navy Admirals had. It's just, it's actually having the money and the time to take things out and the freedom of ships. If you only have a certain number of ships and you need to have ships in certain places, then that dictates your service and maintenance and upgrade schedule. <laughs> Take care, CJ90. Thank you, everyone. And looking forward to signing a video. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. I'll record that tomorrow, I think. Hopefully. Thank you, Derp Squad. Thank you, everyone. And take care. Night night. And um, have fun. Thank you, Suffer Dawson. Take me to 640. Ooh, what's the next video? Oh, wow. What's the next video? Next video, uh, Budacea class. That was uploaded today. So that comes out on Tuesday. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of videos coming up. Thank you, Carol. Bye, and have fun.